mic'd up with Mikey Matuk. Got the boys in. I got Lloyd. We got J Mitch. We got Jackie Boy. He tried to jump up and he might have knocked it in. It Good time. Let's go. What a start to the Monday. <laughs> Oh, I'm <laughs> I mean, I'm from Lafayette. My boys would come in and say, oh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. So I'm, me and Joe on the ground. I got Joe in the headlock. And he's sitting there. <laughs> Helmet. He's, he's punching me in the stomach. Like, steady punching me, punching me, punching me. Here, and he's, there's everyone sitting around. Who here thinks Ochinko can practice today after having five full beers? And he goes, Chad Jones, right? Chad's been with the team. <laughs> <laughs> Six for, minutes. For seven minutes, right? <laughs> Chad's like, no, nah, man. I, I don't think I'm going to practice today. And I was like, I look back, I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I fucking saw you there. You were more fucked up than me. She on the spirit plane had some issues, I think. She was sleep, sleep farting. You heard her or you just thought it was her? I, I sat right next to her. I smelled it. Whoa. What was that? Time to start the show. Oh. <laughs> 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 I don't want to eat why would wow. I have that? Oh, but, God, you had it in a circus or something. What was that? <laughs> Six for three, I'm late. Like, I don't even know what I'd be doing. <laughs> now, when you do go to spring training, are you going to bring your chinchilla and your turtle? <laughs> My dad tell you about it. Yeah. <laughs> the SEC is, God, they hate fat people. <laughs> I mean, I get crushed for that. You know what I mean? And it's like, come on, man. Hey, it is, it just the South, bro. You got a bunch of food down here. Yeah, like, they, they they're just, all they're faster just, than him. <laughs> Players, look at Lloyd. <laughs> you know what, Lloyd? <laughs> I mean, you're looking for a recruiting coordinator, but, coach. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'll piss my pants right now. We're wearing, <laughs> no way. We're wearing gray pants, long gray pants. He goes, I'll piss my pants right now. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Good evening and welcome back. Today is the first day of March. It's Wednesday, March 1st. Just letting it loose a little bit, huh? Getting it loud and getting loud and proud today, huh? I'm always loud and proud. Yeah, I know you are. Love is I love. You are. Well, I mean, okay. Well, anyways, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we have another great show for you. Our friend Jay Mitch is still in Dallas doing some uh, new marriage couple duties is moving his wife used to live in Dallas to Baton Rouge. And so they are, uh, he is knee deep in, in boxes. Oh. And moving boxes. Congratulations. <laughs> I, might, I, might be, I, might be, I might be next deep. Neck oh. deep in moving boxes. Hey, happy Had wife, happy out. life. <laughs> Man. Um, this, welcome yeah, back. This, this is a lot. This is a lot. We got, a, we got a big show for you today. Obviously, if you were watching the game or if you didn't watch the game because of the Longhorn Network or you just didn't know that our friend, K-Genomics, that's, that's it. That's what it was. That's it. <laughs> it came to us. It came back to us. We'll get to that later. Smart people if, if over you here. Didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't know who K-Genomics was, this man streams games on YouTube, not for money because you can't, right? But he illegally streams them. He can't do that. But he finds a way to do it. Then he gets shut down, shut down, shut down. Always finds a way around it. Last night, found a way around it. Allowed me to watch the game. Allowed a lot of my friends to watch the game. Lloyd was holding out on me. He didn't send it to me until the third inning, the second inning of the game. Well, first of all, it wasn't up until, like, late. I went to his channel twice. And then now he has a couple, of, you know, it's a couple of alter channels that I was <laughs> looking around for. Because I know yeah. our guy. Some burner accounts. <laughs> I know our guy wouldn't let us down in the, in the when he knew that. Every LSU fan was struggling to find the game. And so finally around like the second or third inning, for some reason, my ESPN worked. I have no idea why. I've just got like... The... What's, your, what's your cable provider? Cox. That's why. Oh, okay. So it doesn't... I have yeah. YouTube TV. It didn't work. It doesn't work with yeah, you YouTube have to have TV. Cable. You have to have cable or Sling TV. And so we were... Yeah. I was able to watch the game, but then I had to look out for the boys. Yeah, I appreciate so I that. I appreciate searching. that. 
Game was great. Obviously, they, LSU finishes their Texas road trip, their Austin, Texas road trip, with a huge W over Texas. If you look at – what? Oh, sorry. If you look at <laughs> – if you look at Texas and you look at their record, it's not that impressive. They've played four SEC teams. They're own four against the SEC right now, which probably doesn't bode well for them coming into the SEC next year. But – they are, I think they are, they are, actually I know, they are a lot better team than their record shows. Their pitching staff is actually really good. They're struggling offensively. That's been their issue. They haven't been able to hit. Again, last night, no runs. They didn't score. They pitched really well, didn't score. We're going to get into that. Let's finish, let's go through the Heineken headlines. It's NFL Combine Week. Mm. NFL never sleeps. Tomorrow. Got, it starts tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, you have people on the podium getting called off the podium, having to go get subpoenaed. They have to they figure some stuff out. Rumor is that Jalen Carter is going to be exonerated of all charges. So he got on the podium. Somebody leaks it. Get off. Get on the scale. <laughs> get off the scale. Get on the Turn scale. the camera off. Get off the scale. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. You're Welcome now the, the fattest NFL. kid in camp. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> so Jalen Carter gets on the stage, gets off the stage, in a car to Georgia, announces that say he says. It was alleged he allegedly was part of this incident, this this drag racing incident that led to a car crash and two deaths. He says he is going to be fully exonerated. We're going to see what happens. But NFL draft starts this week, starts tomorrow. This is you know big time for a lot of these guys, guys that maybe don't really have um, a ton of hype yet. Get a bunch of hype, guys. We have a bunch of hype. Everybody's excited to watch it. Obviously, all eyes are going to be on Anthony Richardson. Is he participating in the, in the combine? He's throwing, baby. He's throwing, yeah. but is he doing everything yeah. else, like running and everything? I would imagine if he's projected to go yeah. one overall, he would have to do that, I would assume, because he's not a guaranteed one overall. But if he goes out and shows out, I would imagine Is he, that, still, is he still the uh, the leader in the Vegas, Vegas book right now? I, th- I think so. I mean, I'd have to imagine because Jalen Carter was another guy that was supposed to go one overall, and now I don't think he's going to go one overall. Maybe this won't affect his draft stock, but – I don't know. I mean, I think so. People are still talking about it. It's kind of getting more traction. If he goes out there and shows out, I think it's only going to gain even more. The draft is next month. The Saints have a bunch of picks in the draft, which brings a lot of intrigue for us. Well, as the draft gets closer, we're going to have more Saints um, experts, insiders, talk about what they expect, what they want to see. Uh, We still don't have a quarterback. It seems like Derek Carr is getting closer to making a decision. seems like the Saints are still involved, involved in this. The rumor is Aaron Rodgers is going to be a New York Jet. I don't know if I see that. Uh, is he going to follow the same path that Brett Favre did? Going from Packers to the and Jets? That's the, oh, if, yeah. if that's the case, you might as well. If that's the case, you might as well just write Jordan Love and whenever that happens to somewhere yeah. down the line. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. But Packers we'll to Jets is a career path. Yeah, I, I don't know I don't. if he's going to follow the full Brett Favre. Play no, ball. I know. I'm talking about football on the football <laughs> field, minus the Vikings part. But and the gym, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. on the football field, <laughs> on the football oh, field, and the I mean, he's ball. suing, he's suing, oh, allegedly, he's, a, he's suing Pat field. McAfee. Allegedly. So that's going to be interesting. I would love to see Pat McAfee represent himself, not represent himself, but go in court and like just Pat McAfee. It. You know what I mean? He like, said, he said you're going to put him on the stage. What is going to happen? You know what's going to happen. It's going to be a show. It's going to be great. Hopefully, someone's filming it and it's great content. You know what I mean? He'll have unbelievable, unbelievable viewership. But um, Aaron Rodgers going to the Packers. Where I mean, your head's at? What? Content man now. You like that? Yeah. Aaron Rodgers going to the Jets. Maybe. I don't know. He came out of the darkness. He said his 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 decision is is near. We will see what happens with that. If you didn't know, LSU men's basketball still has a basketball team. They are still playing. They're still in the season. It is senior night tonight at the PMAC. No matter how bad they have been, go and support. I don't, they don't have many seniors, but go and support these guys at the PMAC for their last home game. I think KJ Williams is a senior. I believe Parker Edwards is a senior. Um, I don't know who else. That may be the only two seniors they have on the team. But go and support those two guys. It's the last home game, the last time you're going to see them. You know, hopefully you see some of these freshmen do something well. But they've had a tough season. Hopefully Matt McMahon can go back and rebound, figure it out in the transfer portal because the recruiting class coming in next year does not have a bunch of guys. And I think they only have two guys right now signed for next year. He's going to have to re-recruit the guys he has on his team. He's going to have to hit the transfer portal. And God forbid he does this again. If he does this again for two years in a row, I'd imagine that he's probably not going to be here for much longer. I don't want to see that. I think that he is a good coach. But 
you've got to win some games. You've got to do something, show some improvement, and we really haven't seen that. It being Wednesday means it's also Ask Mikey and Mitch Day. We've had a ton of questions. I, we, we were all over Twitter with our, not our takes, but our opinions on the game. I probably should have been more on Twitter for my personal account instead of in our group text that I was giving my thoughts and, and stuff about the game. But, you know, it's, it, it happens we'll so fast. We'll, we'll, we'll get better about that. Yeah, but it happens so fast. It's hard to live tweet. It's like some of these tweets that I'm tweeting, nobody's going to see because they're literally happening in succession. So I don't know. Uh, we'll figure some out. But it's Ask Mikey and Mitch Day. We have a bunch of questions that were sent to us um, through Twitter. We also, I'm assuming, I'm imagining we're going to have questions that are going to be sent to us through the chat. I'm sure there's some that are already coming in. Lloyd is in charge of the chat. Um, but we're going to get to them. In the 7 o'clock hour, that's when the Mikey and Mike Mitch questions will be answered. At some point. What's that? Said it could pass that off uh, at some I'd point. I'd like for that to happen, yes. Absolutely. Um, LSU football, last thing before <laughs> look we get. Look at Lloyd on, on the spot again. <laughs> last, thing, last thing I want to talk about, I want to hit, hit on before we start talking to LSU baseball, is LSU football. Uh, hired two new coaches this week. Last week, last yesterday, they made it official and hired a new uh, special teams coordinator, John Jancic. John Jancic, Jancic was already on staff as an analyst, and uh, he is now the special teams coordinator and outside linebackers coach. Going to help Matt House with that department, so Matt House can focus more on, um, you know, packages and trying to scheme up things as opposed to actually being an individual coach. So. I think that's good for the team. You have a guy that was coming from in-house, kind of understands the culture already, has been a head coach, has been around the game, has been under uh, Brian Kelly before. So I think it's a good hire. And, uh, you know, it can't be worse than last year. That's what I was going to say. It, feel, it feels like, you know, any any change is probably an improvement. But man's still in the building. He's doing what he does best, which is recruit. You know, so it's good to see him. Which is stay in the building. Let me stop. <laughs> I think that I think. Look, if he's going to be the GM and he's going to recruit, I think that's fine. I think that's a perfect situation for him. You need a GM now in college football to he's manage a, everything. So that's he's good. obviously got. I must say, he's obviously got serious value to uh, Brian Kelly. So like, you know, no, you can keep GM, that look, in mind. GM position holds weight in their family. It runs in their family. Yeah, that of course. Was a GM too. Of course. Hall of Fame GM. That didn't think Lamar Jackson was any good. Yeah, the running back. Yeah. He's running back. Yeah. I wonder what he thinks about Jaden. Honestly, if, here's my thing. Even if Lamar Jackson wasn't a quarterback, like his skill set coming out and the way he ran out of college, like if you didn't think that he could play quarterback, which you're dumb, and especially now, but like looking at him now, you're like, is his skill set as a running back or would it be a wide receiver? Like he's tall, he's lean. Like I think wide receiver would be more of the skill set than a running back and say, hey, just hand the ball and get him. Like I don't know. But it doesn't matter because – he is a really good quarterback. He's an MVP quarterback, and he's going to be a free agent quarterback. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, let's say franchise him, which I think they'll probably will or trade him. I don't know what's going to happen. You, yeah, there's a lot, I, of, I drama. The there's a lot of drama in the NFL uh, free agency right now. Can you, you, can't, you can turn down the franchise tag, correct? Or do you have to? Uh, yeah, that's how he's going to end up being a free agent. You can turn it down? Did it. I think so. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I think there's two different types of tags they can use on him. The one that will allow them to be able to, if they can trade him, to get more picks or something like that. I forget how it goes. But I think he's going to end up getting tagged and traded. That's what I personally think. Tagged and traded. Wow. And then whoever he gets yeah. traded to, they're probably going to have a contract and get the contract down to restructure. Yeah, he's yeah, going to yeah. get – exactly. He's no going to get traded two days later. Here's the extension. No doubt. No doubt. I believe that. Um, all right, let's get to the baseball talk, right? Because – LSU had a they had a long road trip, which you don't normally see this early in the season, right? Like you don't normally see a team, especially a number one team in the country, travel and go play three game tournament, round robin tournament style thing in Texas, right? A, a, away games, right. neutral sites, and then say, okay, we're gonna stay there, and we're gonna stay the night on Sunday and Monday, and then we're gonna play against a top team. We're not, they're not ranked top right now, but they last year they were highly ranked. Last year they were a national seed. They're very talented. You're gonna go and play Texas, a big name school, school with a ton of history. And uh, this early in the season, they did that. They go there. They played pit. They played extremely well. It was a very well played game on both sides of, the, of both yeah. sides. Right? LSU ends up coming out with a three nothing three nothing win. Thanks to Gavin Dugas, three-run home run, the top of the ninth inning. I uh, 
you know, you, we, there's a lot of things that we talked about before that game that we wanted to see, right? How is Thatcher Hurd going to rebound after the game against Southern, right? I wasn't too, too worried about Thatcher after one game because it was one game and he hadn't really gotten yeah. his feet wet yet. And he's coming back off an of injury and you just need to give this kid some time, right? So he goes and pitches last night. His first inning, you know, not sparkling, but it was good enough to get out of the inning. No runs. He got out of it. after that. He settled in. He looked like the guy that LSU expected to get. He threw extremely well. I think he went four and two thirds. Yeah, four and two thirds. Gave up three hits. Walked three. The walks need to come down. He, I think that he eventually is going to struck out four and uh, looked really well. Looked like he had control. Kind of got comfortable. Look, his cutter looked like it was it was pretty. It was coming out pretty nice. So it was great to see him, right? People are also kind of weary on the strikeouts. I'm going to get to that because I think that there's a reason for that. I don't think that you're going to see this team continue to strike out. You may have certain guys on the team have more strikeouts throughout the course of the year than you would imagine, right? Jared Jones is going to have to go through some of the stuff as a freshman. He's a freshman. That's just the way it works, right? Like he struck out, yeah. I think, two or three times last night. He struck out four times on Saturday. But – that's just part of the growing pains. He's going to get better as the season goes on. We're going to get into that conversation on why I think some of these strikeouts are happening, and I don't think it's necessarily um, something that we need to be scared about moving forward. I think that this thing is fixable, and I think that you just got to let – it's early in the season, very early in the season. Like, it's, they've had tw- – they don't even have 30 at-bats yet as a team. I mean, as uh, individuals, right. I would imagine. And so, you know, just give these guys some time. Hitting is hard. Hitting is very hard, especially early in the year. But – um, needless to say, they go out on the road in an actual real true road game, and they take they come out with a huge win, some high-pressure situations. Ackenhausen was unbelievable. Rosenbagger was unbelievable. And uh, he threw, what, three and – Three and a third. Three and a third, and we I mean, kept him at bay. Like, they couldn't do anything on him. He was locating. He was spotting up. He got up to 95, I think, on that. You saw Griffin Herring on Sunday. Yeah throw 95 so I think that shows you why they put Riley Cooper as, as a Saturday guy because he has confidence in the lefties he has coming out of the bullpen what did you see did you were you able to watch any of the game I know that 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 link was kind of whatever but I got to watch a good bit of the middle innings through pretty much the end of the game um yeah Ackenhausen was impressive man he was lights out he threw well the day we saw him throw um, to see him back it up with the outing like that on the road, hostile environment. You know, these people are going crazy there. Um, it was very, very, very impressive to see Christian throw the way he threw. Is impressive. He's been very good all year. Seems like and, he's the closer, uh, right? Like it seems like he's the closer. I think he's. I think he's the stopper, bro. Like I think he right. right now is literally the guy that's floating around doing it all. I'm interested to see what they end up really doing with Ty Floyd as the season progresses too. But the thought of having them both of them back there, they back into the bullpen, and our Christian kind of on, I guess, on call whenever you need him, whenever he's ready, whenever he's available, is um, it's an unbelievable like situation that they have. Uh, some great plays that was made on defense last night. Jordan Thompson made a great play in the big in the middle innings, um, the turn of the double play to get out of an inning. Look, Nipple you can say what you want about is the it, hitting. Is it, is it Nipple yeah. Or Nipple? Nepal. Nepal. Nepal had a great play at third yeah, base. Yeah, he did. He had a great play at third base. Look, you can say what you want about hitting. I'm not too worried about hitting and or the strikeouts right now. Like, we know that this is a good hitting team. I don't care what you've seen from them through, what, eight games so far. We know this is a good hitting team, right? So I do believe that the hitting will come around. I do believe that the strikeouts will come down. And But to see them playing defense the way they're playing it, to see them pitching, and at the end of the day, to see them outscoring other teams right now is what I'm going to hang my hat on, keep watching, and as I, you know, kind of, I guess, assess what I've seen so far from well, the let's, team. Let's talk, let's talk about that. Since, we, since I brought up the hitting, the strikeouts, you brought up the strikeouts, and I, I want to just I want to throw some things out there, right? I don't know the exact stats, and it's easy to find. I can go, we can go look those up. But they've played eight games. Yeah. The two games that they struck out the most were Iowa – in Texas, right? Yeah. Iowa had a guy on the mound throwing 100 miles an hour with a 92 mile an hour slider, and he had no idea where it was going, right? He couldn't spot up. He didn't really know kind of how to control his stuff, and he walked eight guys, but he also struck out a bunch of guys, right? 
And so yeah. in baseball, the way things work sometimes, when you get put in that situation, you get that type of like thinking and the mindset at the plate of, okay, this guy, I'm not sure if I can really let it eat off this guy because I just don't know if this ball is going to be at my chin or if it's going to be on the outside black at the knees, right? I don't know where he's going to happen. And he's got electric stuff. So like, you've got to try to figure it out. And so he does his thing. The team gets out. Then they bring in the lefty after him. And that lefty was, was locating. He was doing the umpire. Maybe have a little bit of a wider zone. He was taking advantage of that. And the guys seemed like they were still in that mentality that they had with the starter. And sometimes when a guy does that and he kind of gets you put into that situation and that mindset, sometimes it's hard to shake, right? The next day, they go and they have a really good game offensively and they do what they do. Then they go play on Tuesday in Texas, right? You have LeBaron Johnson, right? He is on the mound and he has been a guy, they're like, well, he redshirted last year because he got hurt or he redshirted his freshman year because he got hurt. And then, you know, last year he didn't throw that much. Listen, this kid is real. This guy's got super talent. He was up, it was 98, yeah. 99 last night with an absolute nasty yeah. split finger. If you don't know how hard it is, yeah. to hit a, if you don't, if you've never seen a split finger, then you have no idea how hard it is to hit a split finger, right? And so what he did was he got in there. I mean, you know how it is. Tell me. I mean, it's. I, dude, uh, dude hitting, hitting a split finger is not it. To me, I'm going to be honest with you, through my career, people who have thrown split fingers, chances are I'd never even swung because by the time it hit the, the catcher's mid, I was like, bro, what? Oh my God, what was that? Yeah, like, so unless it was like a two strike situation. Especially if it's situation. tight, if it's tight and it just tumbles. Like if yeah, you can no, kind of see it, knuckle out of his hand and fall, it's different. Yeah, those are those are like the not very good ones. But if right. you got a good one, I was like, well, I don't, I don't know what that was. So unless it was a two strike situation, I probably never really swung at it. Right, right. And so it's hard, right? Like you don't see a lot of splitters, especially in college baseball. You see more of those than when you get to professional yeah. baseball. So this kid's yeah. pairing a 99 mile an hour fastball with an 88, 89 mile an hour split finger, right? Which is very, very, very hard to hit that I think the team did a really good job of battling and getting his pitch count up high, right? Getting yeah. him out before the fifth inning. He didn't throw five full, I don't believe, or did he throw five full? Whatever he threw. Uh, that I'm not sure of. I'm not exactly sure the exact um, – I'll tell you right now, actually. He threw five innings. So he, he, he got through five innings, right? But he threw 100 pitches in five innings. He struck out nine. His, my point of saying this is his stuff is extremely good. Pair that with a team who's still early on in the season trying to get their feet wet, trying to get in a rhythm offensively, that's tough, right? And the other guys that came in behind him, their, pit, their stuff was really good. They threw really well. Hitting is very hard. My whole point is it's very early in the season. This team is not uh, going to strike out at that rate for the course of the season. You have to – I and think they played two pitchers. The two games that they struck out a bunch had two pitchers that had elite stuff – and you're pairing them with the early part of the season when the guys are still trying to get acclimated to the season. And I'll say this too, like I'm literally looking at the stats right now. For me, I think the the micro the microscope kind of being on the strikeouts right now is a little bit more than what it really is. As I'm looking at it, of everyone on the team who has at least 10 at-bats outside of Paxton and outside of Jared Jones, all of them have a better than two-to-one strikeout-to-walk ratio. Right. And none of them have, and none of them besides Jared Jones has more strikeouts in the games played. So, like, it hasn't been as big of a problem as you think. They've had two games where, you, like you said, they've faced elite arms that they've never seen before that they really don't even know anything about until they stepped in the box the first time, and then here you go. You right. know, so, like, those are those are very, very, very tough situations. Um, I, I mean, I get it, you know, like you might want to – the thought of being able to knock down strikeouts and not have those kind of games, yeah, that's great. Everybody wants to be able to do that. But I don't really think as you look at them as a team, as a, as a whole, that it's been as bad as what it's perceived to be right now. And once again, you're looking at a 7-1 and one team who ha who has, you know, played fairly well over the year so far. Yep, no doubt. And they have they have a, a three-game series this weekend. Is it against us? Uh, is it Sanford this weekend or Sanford next weekend? No, no. Sanford this weekend because they have A&M next weekend. First SEC game of the weekend. Uh, yeah. First SEC series yeah. of the year is next weekend, right? They have A and M next weekend, but you're right. I mean, I I, I think that they're fine now. They have Butler. A oh, Butler. <clears throat> so Butler, Stanford, then A and M. No, they have. So I'm looking at the schedule right now. They play Texas. Then you go to Butler. 
Uh, no, versus Butler, versus Central Connecticut. Oh, uh, they Butler, got a few teams Labar, in. Lamar, Sanford, Sanford, New Orleans, then A and M. So wait, what? Oh, it's a four what, game what? series. Oh, it's a four well, game series this week. Is or it's this... a four game series. Okay. It goes Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and they probably play a Wednesday against Lamar yep. in the weekend, right? And they go, then they have Sanford at home, and then New Orleans in the midweek, and then A and M. So when's the A and M game? Friday, seventeenth. 16th, right? Friday, March 17th, they go to A&M. All right, so this weekend, Friday, who do they have? Friday, they have Butler. Okay, Saturday. Central Connecticut. Okay, Sunday. Is it Central Connecticut? Is that right? Yeah, Yeah. that seems right. Then Sunday, Central Connecticut. So Central Connecticut twice. And then Butler, so they must be doing a little... So Butler on Monday. sort of round robin type Yeah, Butler on Monday. Yeah, a little round robin. So you got Butler, you got... Butler, Central Connecticut, Central Connecticut, and then Butler. Butler again. So and then you four have, games. Then you have Lamar. On what day? Wednesday. Okay, Lamar on Wednesday. And then you have a weekend series with Sanford. Midweek with New Orleans. Shout out Blake Dean. And then... Oh, yeah, that's correct. It's three. It's you. you yeah, so that's I'm correct. Right. So I'm right. Yeah. So next weekend is, is... It's two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. March next... 17th. Two weeks until they open up SEC play. It. So got there's it. two got more it. weekends got it. Got before it. they open up got SEC it. play. Got it. Got it. Got it. I was confusing myself. I was you got confusing it. Confusing myself. I got you it. Got it. We're there. I got it. 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 You, know, you got to stagger. You got to stagger the I got it. You can't say I got it. 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 You got to stagger the. You got to stagger the calls. So you don't just. You don't run into each other. <laughs> oh. Hey, my favorite thing to do was was calling it as lazy as possible. I got it. I got it. I got it. Just keep saying it. I used to do it. I used to try to space out the I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. He used to hate when I did that. <laughs> hate it. That's hate how you it. know you're in a good spot, though, with the coach. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the game, right? Back to the game. We're talking about the pitching staff, talking about the strikeouts. I don't think the strikeouts are fine. I, what I did like offensively that they did, I know they didn't get a ton of hits, but they made the pitchers work. They fouled off a ton of pitches. They yeah. were able to put themselves on, like, in, in scoring position, on the bases, make the pitchers work a little bit harder than they wanted to. Now, what they do have to get better at offensively is is coming through with the big hits with guys on base, yeah. right? They yeah. that's that's the two best pitchers they faced throughout the course of the year. Both games they were they were one or I guess two for fifteen or sixteen with guys on base, and that's got to have a little bit of a change. Hey, wait, no no questions yet, dude. What are you doing? Oh, I didn't mean to send them. I was wow. just trying to send them into the queue. I was send them into the queue. Look at this. Later, later, Look at later. This. Look at later. this. Just so you know, a little tease. Yeah. That's what uh, we call it yeah. in the biz. Oh, yeah. That's what we call it in the biz, a little tease. And that's what Howard Stern taught me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, so Goodness anyway. Goodness gracious, Lloyd. <laughs> you stay over there. Why don't you pick up that couch? <laughs> they, it's March, uh, baby. You back to work. <laughs> <laughs> They uh, they fouled off a bunch of pitches. They made the guys work. They they got the pitch counts up, and they were able to finally break through in the ninth inning with the, with the big hit. But they do need to get better at, at hitting with guys in scoring position. I think Jay knows that. Actually, I know Jay knows that. I know the guys know that. Yeah. And sometimes that just yeah. happens. Like you're not going to be perfect always. I'd rather this happen early in the season and still eke out, eke out some wins as opposed to it happening in the middle of the SEC play. Now, SEC play as, does as start. As weird as it is too, when you're not as weird as it is. Too, when you're not executing like that and you're not doing exactly what you want to do, you know, it usually only takes like one hit, one situation for in those situations where everyone knows, like, hey, this is where we've been struggling, and then all of a sudden it gets going, and then now that gets the train going, not only for that game, but for times to come after that, too. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I, I mean, look, the defense was flawless. I say flawless, they had one error. And it was Trey Morgan. It was a very hard play. That's a very tough play to make with a guy running down your face, running down the line, and you got to try to get it around there. He maybe could have let the ball go foul, but he thought that he was able to get it and get the guy out and get an out, right? And if you, you have to trust your guys in those situations, if they believe they can get that out, you get that out. Unfortunately, they didn't. The guy got to second base. He ended up not scoring. But for everybody watching the game and not really ever being in that situation, that is a very hard play, right? You either got to throw it around the base runner or over the base runner. And throwing it over the base runner is extremely hard to do because it's hard to – you can't really judge how fast he's going and how hard you have to throw the – you don't want to sail it over the first baseman, right? Now, by rule, that guy should have been out. Based off of what the rule book says on how you need to stay in the baseline – 
Now he was called safe. That's fine. I don't necessarily agree with the rule, but I've been called out on that rule. A lot of people that I've played with have been called out on the rule of running in the baseline or not in the baseline. If you straddle the line, like the foul line, you're technically out of the baseline. You're supposed to run on the outside of the foul line in between that box. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But defense, the whole point of this was the defense played really well. Jordan Thompson made some plays. Um, it's the rule not the same as it is in high school where you just, if the catcher just hits you in the back. Like, that's what our catcher used to do who went to play at ULM. He's a good catcher. No, you can hit him in the back all you want. He, if, you're out, the, if you're out of the run line and you plug him in the back, then you're allowed to, then you're called out <coughs> because you're obstructing the throw. Right. That's the rule. Right. So we, so you don't have to worry about necessarily throwing it over or around anybody. So I was just wondering if that was something that was similar. If that's the same, if the rule carries over. Yeah, but if you if you just hit him in the back and they are legally in the base, like where they're at, then that doesn't. No harm then no he's, foul. No, the guy's yeah. safe. No, not only is he safe, he's still running too. Yeah, he's safe. There's no like, telling where that ball's no going to ricochet to. Like, just because you hit the guy in the back doesn't mean he's out. No, I know we're not playing cut ball, but I'm, right. I'm saying at least it might be a safer throw to be able to, if you could square him up in the back, then we have at least a little bit of a play instead of throwing it away and giving away an extra Wait, back. but if you square him in the back, you have no chance of getting the out. Unless they call him out for being yeah. obstructing the obstructing Yeah, but that's... The but no. So you're, you so you're, you're banking, banking on the umpire. That's, that's, that's the that. last thing you yeah. want to do. That's that the last you thing you want to do. do. No, you have to try to get the out, and if, if he is obstructing the throw, that's why Jay went out there and talked to him, because if he is obstructing the throw... In that same situation, if you were lying on the umpire, you are. But you still have a chance to get the guy out. Um, it's just it's one of those weird rules. I think that it's a rule that needs to be updated in baseball. I don't know if it's hey, ever going to happen. They're on it, Coach. They're, they're trying to get to it. What? They're trying to change the rules. We saw huh? it. Listen, listen. I'm, I'm still not a huge fan of the pitch clock. But mm -hmm. I do see the the results of the games being faster. Now, what, the game, what it is doing... <laughs> Let me let me rephrase my like not a fan of the pitch clock. I'm a fan of making the games faster and kind of run a little bit smooth. Like there was a lot of downtime. Pitchers would walk around the mound. Hit, batters would walk. Hitters would walk out the box and do a bunch of different things. And I get it. Like you're trying to calm yourself down. You're trying to do this. That's all fine. Hitting is right? hard. Hitting is hard. Right. That's what you want to do. But some of it was very unnecessary. Like there's pitchers that we call it. They're human rain delays. Like they take forever. <laughs> To pitch and as a def in, the, in, in defense, you're like, dude, let's go because I'm bored. I'm sitting out here in the outfield and like you're taking 45 minutes to get through an inning because you're taking forever, right? So what this what this pitch clock is doing, and I've seen it, you're starting to see it. It's starting to speed these guys up, right? So taking away some of the downtime. The part of the pitch clock that I don't like is and kind of happened last night, right, with Jared Jones. It's the it's the top of the eighth inning. You have two outs. You have Jared Jones up the bat with two strikes, and he has the ability to go out of the ballpark at any time, right? It's a 0-0 game, nobody on base. He has – takes too long to get in the box. He gets struck out, <laughs> inning over, boom, just like that. I'm like, yeah. gosh, that's just like – I understand those are the new rules, and you have to enforce them, and you have to be strict, but, like, that's the part of it that I don't like. The situation that happened in spring training, bases loaded, two outs, 3-2 count, tie game in the ninth inning you have this kid up there who at this point in spring training this guy probably may not get that opportunity again he may, i know it's spring training you gotta work on it but you may not get that opportunity again because he's probably a young guy he's probably just got in the game and this is his chance of like being a hero even though it's spring training it's a big thing and he gets punched out big space off of the of the pitch clock and it's like in those situations when the pressure is is heightened and all of that is on you and everybody's looking at you, like those are the times where you maybe need to take a little bit extra time and take a deep breath and be like, okay, let me get reset and let me go. I mean, this is the, like the make or break pitch and he gets struck out. That's what I, I don't like about it. I, I, I like the thought of like, I think it would be a better working system if through like maybe the first six, the timing of it stayed the same. And then when we get to seven, eight, nine, Maybe there's five more seconds added on each side of it. So instead of 20, there's 25. Instead of having right. to be in the box at at eight, you get all the way down to three years. So I don't, I, something like that to where there is – you can account for someone trying to slow the – I guess not so much the pace, but the, your the, the feeling of the yeah. game at that point. Right, right, no doubt. And that's – like I said, when I say I'm not a fan of the, of the pitch clock, like 
It's not that I hate the fact that they're trying to get people fa- to go faster. I don't like the pitch clock being the reason why you win or lose a game. I don't like that part of it. Yeah. I, under- I like the fact yeah. that games are going – like if you can get games under the three-hour mark consistently at two and a half hours, like that makes it a lot more – like watchable, right? Like, you, like the game was rolling yeah. last night. No doubt. Now last night's a little different because it was such a pitcher's duel, and like there was no hits, and it was it was zero zero, and it was, like that helps yeah. obviously those games. I mean, I've, even without the pitch clock, I've had games that were two hours and twenty five minutes because it was one nothing, and you know it was just two a hours duel. and ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But for the most part, like that doesn't happen. So like that kind of went into it. I think the pitch clock is eventually going to be a good thing for baseball. It's just they have to iron out the kinks. They just I just don't want to see yeah. somebody get in the World Series and but, but have me, this opportunity. To me, to to me it's crazy to know. But I just don't understand. And I say understand. I just don't. I don't agree with where it is right now. And the simple fact that this them doing the pitch clock right now isn't off of off season meetings and then no, they say right. let's do it. They've they've done this through independent ball seasons. They've done this through the minor league seasons. The kinks should be worked out. You get what I'm saying? Like there should be ways to make this. It shouldn't be. We still we shouldn't have games and innings decided off of a strike call, a ball call that never actually happened. Well, and here's and here's I the, think here's we should, the, I think we should be past the point of that already. By, no doubt. By knowing how the to have this working in the game by the time we bring it to these levels, and then obviously in the big league level and all that stuff as well. No doubt. And so I think what and I saw this. I can't take credit for it. I wish I can give the credit to whoever said it, but it was I saw it on Twitter. I think, and it was said that. Listen, eventually, I mean, the pitch clock started when we were in the minor leagues, right? So the pitch clock probably yeah. started in like 14 or 15 in, in the minor yeah. leagues. And so all of the guys that are coming up now, whether it be from college to the minor leagues or high school to the minor leagues, like once you get in the minor leagues, you are going through a pitch clock. Like you are dealing yeah. with the pitch clock. So. All, as all of these older guys get aged out and get re- start retiring and start moving on, that next generation of baseball players that are coming up have the pitch clock's normal to them, right? So like right. the uh, you're gonna have the league kind of get shifted out, and so all these young guys are gonna be used to the pitch clock, and it's gonna feel like a normal thing to them. It's just the guys who aren't used to it yet have to get used to it now, and that's that's kind of where you have a little bit of that disconnect. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean, no, I agree. Like I saw, I saw today there was a, I think a Carlos Correa at bat where he fouled off a pitch. Yeah, yeah. Didn't realize what was going on, and he's like walking around, and he literally just like jumps back, like legit jumps back into the box, and then tries to, you know, be a part of the next pitch. I guess like those things are a little weird. That's going to happen through time, and and they think that it's no big deal. These are spring training games. Like the the majority of guys that's going to open this year on a big league roster, they could give they don't care about these at bats for the most part. Right. Right. Like they know this is going to, so like you're, I think you're going to see this affect a little more games in the big leagues once the season starts. And I don't like, and like I said before, like you get to the eighth inning, I don't like seeing pressure spots in the game kind of be dictated by a game that is in its entirety since day one has never had a clock. Right. And it really doesn't feel right to play it with some sort of a clock. Right. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in the first year. I just hope that it doesn't happen in the postseason. I don't even know if I love the pitch the, clock's I, going I love to be the on idea. The no, yeah, I love the idea of what it does. I love how it moves things along. Like I love, I love how it doesn't allow, you know, I guess the slow pace of the game. I just think when it gets to the back end of the game, there has to be some sort of an extension, some sort of kind of a wiggle room area to be able to slow, really pressure pack situations down. No doubt, no doubt, hundred percent agree. Lloyd, what's your what's your opinion on the pitch clock? I'm actually I understand like there's two. Are sides. you working back there? You just just no, not I'm working. I'm okay. over here. I'm just keeping the chat involved. I'm trying to get Ash, Mikey, and Mitch all all situated as you saw earlier when we flashed one on the screen. No big deal. Just doing four jobs at once. Oh, okay. yeah, there we oh. go. Man, I got poked oh, in the eye. I can boy. only see the I can only see the goal with one eye. That was a whole LeBron. That was a LeBron move right there. Speaking Jesus. of, he's out for I guess forever. Yeah, he's gonna retire. Yeah, you finish, wish. Finish <laughs> what you're my favorite player. Finish what you're saying. No, I, I I do like the merit to it. I the only thing that I don't I wish they had a little bit more feel as to when to do it and when not right. to do it. You so you're on par with us. Yeah, you can't. There's so many moments in baseball where, like you said, if you're like need to take a beat, like big moment. That's what baseball is all about, right? It almost sets the scene a little bit to where you can see the the drama building and like all right, step out the box, pitcher steps off, like. I understand that you're setting up, especially when it gets into big time baseball. 
I don't know how they're going to enforce it at that point. And it scares me yeah. a little because it worries me about how the NFL is, where Major League Baseball, firstly, already had a problem with umpires like in, inserting themselves into the game yeah. a little bit, right? And yep, now so. you see with like the National Football League and even college football where it comes down to these calls that are objective maybe in a sense to where it doesn't matter. Like the one with – I saw one at – spring ball where he got in the he was wasn't ready to hit like he has to be in the box ready to hit with eight seconds left and he looked ready to hit to me boom strike out and they had um yeah who's the shortstop for the new york mets that uh francisco lindor was like oh i guess that he, he was mic'd up on the field and he's like oh here we go strike out that's out number one for us he's like i had no idea what just happened like he was <laughs> literally talking on the microphone yeah but the guy was in the box ready to hit and the umpires yeah. are so gung ho to try to enforce it right now. I hope they kind of find a middle ground to where it's all right. If yeah. we're in October, well, or if we're in yeah, Omaha, well, so I guess the yeah. Well, the point you're trying to make is kind of it brings me back because you're not wrong, and it brings me back to the thought process of how I love that. He I guess always the thinks NFL I'm is be wrong. He's like, no, uh, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm saying, I mean, I'm saying, in the thought process of it brings me to the point of like how the NFL still kind of deals with the delay of game. Like it's not a as soon as the clock hits zero, right, it's, right, right, right. you know, it's kind of there. Like I think once you like you're saying, like if the guy's, you know, two feet in the box and his head's about to come up, like, but it's not up and his hands aren't up yet, like, and it's at eight seconds or it's under eight seconds, like, well, feel here's like we the, can let that one slide. A here's bit. the deal. You know, like that, that doesn't, I don't feel like that needs to be the one that gets called. Here's the deal. Here's the deal though. If, if the guy's in the box, he has two feet in the box and he's not looking, who cares? It's, that hasn't stopped the umpire in the past from not making a pitcher stop really throwing hasn't. the ball. Right? Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've been, seen guys like Max Scherzer. Yeah, I've seen guys like Max Scherzer with two feet in the box. They the whole pitch is thrown, and they they never made a big deal about it. So like, at this point, why right. is it a big well, deal? Exactly. If he's got two feet in the box, like I, I've been yeah. in the box one time, and there's been a pitch on the mound who work, works really quick, and I was trying to get comfortable, and I'm literally about to pull my head up, and the ball goes right by, right by me. I'm like, Jesus yeah. Christ! I wasn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. Umpire didn't call time. Nothing like. That's happens before. So why now? Yeah. Just because they're not in the box. If they have two feet in the box, that should be fine. That's all that matters. As long as you're in the box. First off, that's all that first off the first off the box is way too big anyway. Because to be able to just keep one foot in the box and like be anywhere near where you're supposed to be to hit is yeah. damn near doing a split. Yeah. Right. So the whole two feet in the box thing is crazy. Because I think the I actually think the rule really is is as long as you have two feet in the box, you're supposed to be like the game's on, right? right? Now we know there's usually a feel about it. Like I can have two feet in the box and be literally looking the complete other way. But I, I do think that that's the real rule for it, right? So it's crazy to me that that's – it's kind of an arbitrary rule of, oh, is he ready to hit or is he not? Or can I quick pitch him? Can he not? Because the quick pitch has happened in the past. We've known when it's happened in the past. We've known how Bush it's always been. But some guys still try to do it until they, can, until they can't get away with it. Right, right. So I, I, it's, it's a real finicky rule to me in a way. And I just – I wish there was some way in the back in the game that we can have some leeway and kind of make it more about the game than we make it more about – Hey, are we still trying to speed this thing up? You know, no doubt, no doubt. Um, that was a long conversation about the pitch clock that I didn't think that we were going to get into, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the things that happened in the game. What well, before we like before we ended? I just it feels like it's that was the first time it's bit LSU and it's helped LSU what probably two or three times this year at least. Yeah, I would say yeah. twice. It's, it's yeah. helped them, but whenever. It, People are going to have different opinions whenever it affects your team in a no different doubt. way. I mean, of and that's, that's what it is yeah. because it's a subjective rule and a game that's very much objective. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I personally, like, at the end of the day, like, I really, I'm being completely honest when I say this. Like, if, if LSU were to win a game in Omaha off of that, that, to me, honestly, wouldn't feel that good. No. Like, I'd be no, like, no, man, no. I actually like, right. to, like to see him execute something and win the game as opposed those are people walking off the field because of something like that happened. Now, look, I get it. Probably 95% of a fan base would be like, I don't care. We won. I personally wouldn't like to see that. I, like, I want to see you actually go do it. Yep, 100%. And talk, speaking of execution, right, that, was, that leads me into my next point. Before we get into <clears throat> the other stuff, the Ask Mikey and Mitch, some of our segments, I want this whole first hour really to be about kind of our recap of the game, and then we'll go from there, right? So some of the execution last night, I thought maybe could have been obviously a little better. You had some people hate are so anti bunt. I am not. I do not like to bunt. Like I am not. I'm anti. I mean, shit. I got pinched <laughs> bunt for my freshman year in college. Like I do not like to bunt. Right. 
Like Mike, Mikey's not a big bunter. If y'all didn't realize that or know about it, no, no, no. I probably have like five or six bump base hits in my career, and I probably should have thirty. Right? Three it of them helped. went to the outfield. Three of them went to the outfield. Two of them, he was sliding in second, and they were doubles in the book. Like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like don't like to bunt. Right? Not much feel in those things. It's not, not his thing. That's not it, right? But. When you're called upon to do it, there's certain situations, right? There's not very many. If there's, if you want to talk about a hundred different situations in baseball, there may be in my mind one or two that I think a bunt works. That one I felt I felt like the bunt was the appropriate call for the person yeah. at the plate in the situation that they were yeah. in. Right? Yeah. Runners on Why'd first. Why you feel that way? Why? Well, you had yeah, runners why? on you had runners on first and second with no outs. It's okay. a zero why zero not game. With, why not? Why not with the runner just on first? I absolutely can't stand a ball with their own first base because now you're giving up an out to get a guy to second base. He's not guaranteed. And you're asking me to get a hit. Right. You're asking, you're asking me, me to get a hit. He's not literally. exactly. You have to get a hit. And sometimes you may get two hits. Sometimes you may need to get and two hits to get him in. Sometimes if you get that hit and we still send him, he's still throwing him out. Like right. You're asking me to get a hit to get him in. Right. You're asking me to get a hit to a situation where he can go and score. Right. So I don't like bunting him from first to second. Now, I do like getting. The guys from first and second to second and third with one out. There's a, yeah. a bunch yeah. of reasons why, right? When you're on third base, there's a way it's way easier to score. There's a lot more ways you can score from third base than you can from second base. Let's go through them. Sacrifice fly, right? Ground out. Pass ball. Infield single, right? A normal single. Any, any base hit obviously scores that guy from third base. Yeah. And also what it does is it takes away the double play, right? So yeah. – if you get the guy from first to second, or from first and second to second and third, now the ground ball double play in a situation where you haven't been able to score runs all game is out, is not there. The only time you get doubled off if it's a bad base running or just a fluky thing and the guy hits a line drive and, you, you know, right on second or whatever it is, right? You shouldn't get doubled off. So you take away the double play. You also get yourself in a position to score from third base. Plus, you're putting more pressure on the pitcher and the catcher to be able to execute their pitches. If the pitcher yeah. has a nasty breaking ball, which he did have a good breaking ball last night, if he has a nasty breaking ball and now there's a guy on third base with less than two outs, the likelihood of him trying to bury it and throw a really good one isn't as high because he's scared that he's going to make it. He, he can't let that guy score. So if he throws in the dirt and it gets boxed and goes away and the guy scores, that's that's – you know, that's not what he wants. So you put a little bit more pressure on the guys on the mound and behind the plate to execute. And so I think that situation was the right situation to do it, right? It was a lefty-lefty. It was a guy who's not going to really drive the ball at the ballpark. And you're able to bunt, get the guys over, and now you have to top of the lineup up, right? Unfortunately, yeah. it wasn't executed the right way. What were you going to say? No, I was I wasn't gonna say anything, but I one hundred percent agree with you because I think so for me the reason why I like the bunt with first and second with nobody out is because I do think in that situation, especially when you have a guy who we would consider to be a good bunter, even though the guy he was facing, the angle that's coming from was not very easy to do, is I do think when you're wrong in that situation, it minimizes the 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 bad things that can happen. And at the end of the day, if we don't get it done, the guy's still at second base, right? right? So, like, for me, like, I don't like the idea of just at first because if we don't get it done or a lot of things go wrong, well, he's still at first base. He still ain't in scoring position, right? So what did we really accomplish by making him do that? Now if we get him to second base, that guy's still there. So we could still – that one hit that you may have wanted, whatever it is, is still an opportunity for that. But I do think if we can do it for first and second, get him to second and third – then we're sitting in a spot where it went, like you said, pass balls. You're really making them execute pitches up there. A hit scores two, not just one, most likely, right? Like there's so many more things I think that are beneficial to you there. And then once again, if it doesn't score two, now we're sitting here with runners on first and third at least probably again. That's right. a lot more pressure on them again. Right. So like I, I'm a bigger fan of first and second than I am just first because I just think – it minimizes the bad things that can happen, and it puts a lot more pressure on them in that situation. Nope. I don't, from my experience, and as I go through baseball, like I don't feel like a lot of, 
a ton of arms or a ton of pitchers feel an immense amount of pressure when guys are on first base, whether they're button or whether they're swinging. Put guys in scoring position, and you see people get real tight real quick because they don't want to give up the earned runs. And people look at bunting as like, oh, all you got to do is put the ball on the, ba- the bat on the ball and just get the ball down. Bunting is not easy. Like, bunting is not easy, especially the way guys throw now and how hard they throw and movement. Like, bunting is – I had to bunt off of Edwin Diaz before. How do you think that worked out? Almost hit a home run. Almost hit the whole butt home Can run we find thing. That video? Yeah, I mean, I literally <laughs> bunted. I literally bunted, popped it up to center field. Didn't even get out the. I mean, center field to the pitcher. Should have been center, center field. field really, no, Felt like it was center field. <laughs> popped it up to the pitcher. Gets out. Go inside. I'm sitting down, and Kenzer looks at me. He goes, "Why are you mad?" I was like, "Well, I mean, I kind of fucked the bun up." He goes, "Shouldn't have been bunting anyway. How the fuck are you supposed to bunt that guy? He's throwing 100 miles an hour at your eyeballs, like." You're like they're calling a strike you want, on top you want of the zone. What do you want me to do? Nose behind that? Yeah, how do you want me to do that? Hey, you, you want know? me to put my nose behind that? Yeah. No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, like no, I'm not. Gonna, especially someone who doesn't really bunt, right? So, the whole point is bunting is not that easy. It's not that cut and dry. Oh, just put the bat on the ball and get down. Some guys handle the bat a lot better than others. Uh, Nepal probably handles the bat better than most. I thought. Now this is yeah. what handled the butt defensively great. Yeah, it was a, he made a great play. The other guy popped it up from Texas. He makes a great play defensive play. On, yeah. On uh, on them, right? But for me, Texas leaguer. No, that's not a Texas leaguer. Texas leaguer is a little I know, blooper. I know. No, Texas leaguer is a little blooper. Oh, well, I just uh, thought it was appropriate. Why do they for... call it a Texas leaguer? Oh, that's a good question. Why do they call? Oh, because I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I was. And I Ask was, Mikey and Mitch. I was gonna say. I was gonna say. It's probably. It's because the Texas league is so hot, and guys are usually exhausted, and you just kind of bloop one of those that out there, and just kind of bleed it in there. You should have said that. I would. I would have bought it. Um, you know why they call it a can of corn? Go ahead. It's because whenever they, I know they had uh, you get the uh, corn uh, off the top, and they put it yeah. right in your bed, yep. right in the bread basket. Yep, I got that one. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> I'm not great chef. Like he's he is a he can handle the bat, right? He, uh, that's what he is. I thought that maybe a a move, and this is hindsight. It's always 2020. I'm not the head coach. I'm not the guy who sees these guys every day, right? I'm not the guy who sees the guy bunting every day. I'm not the guy who sees the guy running every day, right? There's two situ- two things that I thought that I would have made, maybe had made a move in the ninth inning. One was Brady Neal, once he got in scoring position, I would have pinch run for him. Now, I don't know how fast he is. I'm not around the team to see them that way, right? So Jay knows more than that. Maybe he's fast enough. Maybe he was comfortable with his speed at second to score on a base hit. But if he's not, let's say if he's a normal catcher speed, I would have thought, okay, maybe you pinch run for him because he is the go-ahead run at second base in scoring position with no outs. You need to score that run, and you have Malazzo on the bench, right? Malazzo ends up coming in the bottom of the ninth to finish out the game. I thought maybe that could have happened. Like I said, I don't know. The other stuff, Jay knows more than I do in that realm of it because he's around these guys every day. The other move I would have made was I would have or at least thought about pinch hitting Merrifield for Nippold, right? Because I think it's a little bit easier to bunt lefty-righty than than lefty-lefty, right? A guy's trying to come into you and Texas was running that wheel play. Now, I guess you don't know they're going to run that wheel play unless you, like, scouted them and they've seen them before but they're running the wheel play so by the time Nepal's bunting that ball like the third baseman is literally right there I mean you saw he popped it up over his head almost was a perfect bunt he almost got a base hit out of it because he almost popped it up over his head and landed in fair territory and everybody would have been safe but they're in there they're making it a lot harder so now you're lefty lefty same side guy guy who's throwing kind of some sliders and you're seeing the third base crash right in your face you're like damn like, this is tough. Now I got to be super fine with it because even if this ball is in the air at all, it's being caught, one. Or two, if I get the ball on the ground, he's fielding it, he's going right to third base, and the guy's out. Right? So Let me, that, let me ask you. Oh, but, okay, go ahead. No, go, 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 go. go. Finish what you're going to say. No, I was just going to say, so my only, my only thought to this, is, and it just hit me as you were speaking about it, right, is the thought process of how many games did Ben the Pope play at LSU last year? Zero. How many games did Brady Neal play at LSU last year? Zero. How many games did they play in a season? 56, right? Mm -hmm. That was game number what? Eight, Eight. correct? Mm -hmm. At some point, I do think you have to figure out what you actually got. No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. And no, no. So so my point is maybe there is, there was some of that in there where he was like, look, I can make this move right now. 
but I won't never, I won't know what these kids can actually do down the line. Great point. Unless I give them an opportunity to show what they can do. Great in point. these situations. So maybe that was part of it too. So maybe that's why he didn't move these guys or pinch it for these guys. Like, hey, I want to see you get the job done. Great, great, great point. And now, as far as like the pinch running, like the, the hitting thing, I get, right? Pinch running, okay. He gave him the opportunity to get on base, right? He did mm-hmm. not pinch hit for him when he was on base on lefty yeah. lefty. And I thought he did. We get we get on Jay a lot. Don't get on. We kind of like joke about the in at bat timeouts that he does, the offensive timeouts. Yeah. I thought that one was a good one. I thought that he yeah. was able to – he kind of rattled the pitcher a little bit, it seemed like. The pitcher was kind of all over the place. Brady Neal comes out that first at bat, and he really goes after – he tries to go after the ball and then tries to hold his swing up, and he goes through and gets that first strike. It was a ball, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other thing that I want to touch on later on the show as far as approach. If you've never seen – never mind. We're not going to get to that. I'm not going to get sidetracked. But he sees it, and he sees, okay, he's a little rattled. He's a little jumpy. Let me call time. Let me tell him, hey, this is the approach. Stick with this. This is what we want to do. Meanwhile, this guy's got to sit there and kind of marinate on it and try to figure out what he's going to do. I mean, I said in the group text, I would not swing. I would I would not have swung. I would make this guy throw me a strike. Obviously, he already had that one. He ends up walking him, throws four straight balls, walks him, gets him to gets him on base, right? So that was the opportunity for him to start the inning. I'm good with that opportunity. I'm good with that. Now, pinchering at second base, I don't know the, the backstory of that. I don't know how fast he is. Um... No, and Nepal had the opportunity to come, to come through, and he, and he it didn't work yeah. out. It ended up not be, being detrimental because Gavin Duga had the big hit, get the big three-run homer. Like, that cool. was enormous, right? But, you know, at yeah. some point in the game, you're going to need that bunt down. And even if he gets the yeah. bunt down with the wheel plate, I don't know if he gets the guys over. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with you. I was just – my thought process, I guess, is, like I said, it's super early in the year. You don't know what some of these guys have. Maybe you, you need to find out before you get to game 50 and say, well, I know for sure because I've given this guy three, four opportunities that he's not. I need to make the move right now to win the ball game, right? Absolutely. And I, I completely agree that season starts and you, you do everything you need to do to win every ball game that you can. I think maybe Jay probably felt that this was something he needed to do to know one, to win this ball game because he did write the lineup with these guys in it, so he obviously believes in them a lot, right? Mm-hmm. So, one, that might have been a thought where I, I, I wrote them in because I believe in them. Now I need to find out if they can actually do it in these situations. And if they can't, not to say that this was a one-off, right? But if they can't, then I know in game 50 or game 60 or game 70, I need to make a move right now. Not wait to the 11th, not wait to the 12th or whatever. I need to make the move now. Yeah, no, you're right. That's a very good point. And I just, you know, like I said, hindsight is what it is. Anybody can question that after the fact. It all worked out, right? The other thing that I want to – go ahead. Before you get on that, if you're if you're the head coach and you see them have the – they were playing the wheel play so aggressively. Like it wasn't like, – well, that's, that's what you're supposed to do well, with Yeah, it. no, but sometimes you see people like, yeah. you know, take off and dead sprint to like from short to third, third like starts creeping in. Third baseman was basically in his lap. Is that some a situation wherever you're like – I mean, you've seen people kind of fake, pull it back and swing where you do. That's I don't the know slash. That, like, yeah. that's that's what that's how you fix that, to be honest with you. Like, they you used can. to teach us in the minor leagues, like, hey, if they're going to wheel play and they want to get up in your shit, pull that shit back and swing it. I'll guarantee you he's going to get out the way or he's not going to do that again. Right. Right now, that's scary. Yeah. As a, that's scary even as a hitter to do that. But, like, that's what they kind of tell you. Now, that's an option, right? Um, because they're basically begging him to – I mean, obviously the pitcher's going to pitch him inside, so they're – Make him throw. He's gonna throw a pitch where he wants him to pit, like bunt it to third. So in the Pulitz mind, he's like, if I could get this down the first baseline, you you almost that's almost well. That's than that's at that a, that's point. a scouting thing, right? Hey, yeah. they love to run the wheel play. If you see, because you see it coming, right? It's not something that yeah. it's right in your face. Like they're only gonna run the wheel play yeah. because they're There's trying to get the action, guy ahead yeah. of you, right? And so you know, if he says, "All right, I'm going to." I see it. I'm going to drop it down. I'm going to try to deaden it and try to pull it down the first baseline a little bit. Now that makes the play almost impossible to get the guy out there, especially if the guy's getting a good read. But, you know, that's that's kind yeah. of it goes into scouting. That's, you know, slash is an option to kind of combat that. You just have to know it's coming. But what I really do want to talk about before we get to the 7, seven o'clock hour, because we have a lot and I want to get to our sponsors too. Um, boy, I tell you what, I'm talking a lot and I haven't had a little mix up. I usually – my brain works faster than my mouth sometimes. I may have just jinxed myself, but I was I had to take a deep breath just there. Just gonna let you I was gonna let the no no ride. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um 
But we weren't gonna speak about it. Just gonna let it ride. Yeah, that, we were. We were talking pitcher about pitcher comes in the dugout and goes, "Oh <laughs> shit, I got. I haven't given up a hit." Well, yet. you know what? I love the pitchers <laughs> that didn't give a shit about the no hitter. Is like, yeah, I got no hit. So what? I'm gonna do it again. Yeah. Right? Confident. What you want to talk about? Yeah, that's what I'm. That's where I'm at. So we talked about this. We talked about situations, and we talked about just really baseball, right? We talked about a couple moves, a couple things I wanted to do. Um, I talked about Jay giving Brady Neal the opportunity to face the lefties, lead off the inning, get on base. And it worked out, right? Now, as an as approach, now these guys are young and they're going to learn and they're going to get used to this situation. But in the approach, right, every time that I came in a game in the, late, in the last part of the game, or if they brought in a reliever in the game later in the game and I had to face this guy and I've never seen him before and I don't really have that scouting report on him, I like to see something. I like to see a pitch, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. I like to, especially when you're down and or your tie game. Like I like to see a pitch because I want to see what it looks like. I can know what he throws. I can know his tendencies. I can do everything. And if I've never faced him, you don't know what it looks like coming out of the arm. You don't know what it looks like timing wise. Like it just, and that's just me. Right. And I'm not saying that's the right play, but last night you see Brady Neal go out there and say, okay, he like, he kind of offered at that first pitch and then check swung and then Jay calls a timeout and he goes and he doesn't swing, doesn't swing the rest of the bat, gets walked on the next four pitches. So technically he's thrown five straight balls because that first one was a ball, right? So now he's yeah. on first base. The next guy is up there and hacks first pitch. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not – the last thing I want to do right now is swing. Like this guy just threw five straight balls. I don't want to swing. I want to take, I'm going to take, I'm going to make this guy throw me a strike, right? I'm going to make it, I'm just going to make it happen. And obviously he did. Another guy got on base. So now it's second and first and second. And then now you face Gavin Duga. They bring in the, uh, the righty and he gives up the homer. Right. But to me, it's right. just like, it's as you, as you progress in your career and as you start seeing things like, Slowing yourself down, slowing the, slowing the moment down is just as important as getting the hit, I believe. I think it, it goes hand yeah. in hand. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. The only guys that, as I got older, the only guys I didn't like doing that with was, let's say if they brought in a lefty, knowing that there would be like, like say, if, say if the inning started and it was a righty, lefty, lefty, or you know, a situation like that. If that guy, if the lefty walked the righty, I didn't like, the, like in four or five pitches and some of these pitches weren't close, I didn't like the idea of just going in there and just giving him a strike because I, I felt like a lot of those guys in those situations, they almost look for lefty to be able to flip the breaking ball in there or throw something in there just to kind of get Well, then maybe hone in so like on one spot, guys, right? Yeah, those yeah. guys I really was like, nah, I'm not giving you another pitch. If you throw me something I really like, like I'm swinging right now. But 100%, like I, usually like guys that you could tell like just don't really have a feel of where it's going – I'm getting in the box and I'm just like, hey man, you're gonna have to show me you can kind of come over this plate right now. Yeah. No, so like I'm, I'm really good. so like that first pitch I would be in the mindset of like I'm taking this, but with every intent, knowing that I'm taking this pitch, I'm gonna take it and get some real timing on it, right? Yeah. If it's the ball, then I'm like, all right, maybe I might just statue you the next pitch, maybe make you a little more uncomfortable, whatever I can do, you know? Right. And it, look, as, as you get older and like the more times you see someone pitch, and the more like, okay, I don't need to like. I know what this guy's got. I've seen him enough. Like, that's different. Yeah. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own ways yeah. of going about it. That was just mine. Like, in that situation, especially how he looked um, that against the, against Brady, I just didn't think that it was a, you know, didn't need, you know, it didn't need to be yeah. super aggressive. And it all it all worked out. Yeah. You know, definitely. It all it all yeah. worked it out. It ended like, up working out, yeah. But, no, I agree with you. Because um, that, could, that could turn around and go into two, two pitches, two weak contacts, and now we got two pitches with two outs and – Gavin up, yep. as opposed to two runners on with one out or nobody out and getting to a two zero count. You know, exactly. Like that could turn that quick. Exactly. Um, all right, so we're gonna take like a, a minute break. Come back on the back side of this minute. We're gonna have the Ask Mikey and Mitch segment. Before I go into the break, though, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Some of our sponsors, Heineken. They've been with us since day one. They're one of the OG ones, OG sponsors. Heineken Silver has is their new product. It is their light beer. It is 95 calories. It's four percent alcohol. It is very smooth. It's very easy to drink. I've enjoyed it. I am not a huge Heineken fan in the past, but I am a huge Heineken Silver fan. I actually got a phone call 
or a text messages from our partners at Heineken. I am riding in the St. Patty's Day parade in a couple weeks, and we got some Heineken silvers that are getting put in the ice chest on the float for us. So I'm excited about it. Lloyd, I think he's going to be throwing Heineken silvers. No, we can't. We can't do that. They can't. That's in the rules. <laughs> you get fined if you do that. Cannot do that. We've asked that last year. I think last year we Beer got in trouble. Then. We actually last year we got in trouble. I think for never. Mind, I'm not going to incriminate myself. So I'm not going to say that. Continue. No, I'm not saying that. What could um, it have been? But Lloyd, ha- Lloyd is. I like drinking him. Lloyd loves him. Obviously, he can. I, your your funnel is the move, right? Which we will. Uh, <laughs> your your day is coming up too. By the way. Yeah, we will. I we will have. I need in wait, a not only is it his funnel day, there's two reasons why I think we may need two of them on this day. Two right? funnels? No, two beers. Oh. Because on Friday, you might Lloyd, need three. Lloyd likes to funnel the beers, right? That's what he does. That's his move. That's his thing. Heineken Silver. He likes to funnel it on Friday. Only as beer a, I ever drink. As it, only beer he ever drinks. As a Friday precursor to the game, as a tailgate thing. Well, this Friday is Lloyd's birthday. Oh, is it on so, Friday? Ooh. Yeah, March 3rd, right? March 5th. Ooh. Oh, 5th, 5th, 5th. You literally said it before the show. Sorry. You talked to me. Your, your, your birthday is on, on Sunday, but this is like the going into your birthday weekend. So we're going to celebrate it on the show, obviously. Well, Between we might friends. need three then because we might need three because we got our, the, you know, the regular scheduled program of uh, Friday funnels. And then we're going to have the birthday funnel. And then I think somebody's getting off the schneid this weekend because he's been playing pepper with the wall. Mm-hmm. And I think he might go up top again this weekend. Oh, yeah. And it might happen Friday night, too. Oh, yeah. And then we got so, that, that uh, one's a video sitting in. Well, that's, yeah, that was about to ask you. I'm going to have to have some for the, for the house. I got you. I got two cases. Or I can drink yeah. anything else. Uh, you know, it, no, no, maybe no, no, if no, I'm no, just no, having no, my no, own no, live base. No, 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 yeah, Coach, I didn't want to tell you. I had six beers, five shots, a blunt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and went to the bathroom for a minute. <laughs> um, but anyway. Didn't even, didn't even sleep. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah I, I'm going 24 straight hours, Coach. Uh, anyway, th- those are our friends at Heineken. Heineken Silver is a new product. It is in stores. Go get it. It's springtime is coming. You're about to go to the beach. You're about to be outside a lot more, hanging out, grilling, barbecuing, golf. playing golf. Bring some Heineken Silvers. Try it out. Um, I promise you you're not going to be disappointed. So, our friends at Heineken Silver, we're proud, we're proud partners with Heineken, and uh, I want to give them a shout-out. All right, we're going to take a minute break. We'll catch you on the backside with Ask Mikey and Mitch. Actually, you know what? Let's go. Ask Mikey and Mitch right now is brought to you by our friends at FCO Development. Okay. There we go. Let's give, let's give them a shout-out, right? I didn't, I didn't give the read to it. FCO Development's a civil construct. You go ahead and read it. Uh, I'm putting together the Ask okay. Mikey and Mitch. FCO <laughs> Evco Development is a civil construction company that specializes in new multi, multi-family construction. They specialize in site drainage, site utilities, earthworks, site clearing, house pads, ponds, demo work, hurricane cleanup. So basically anything that is moving dirt, getting a site ready to be built on vertically, has nothing to do with mathematics. Like Mo- Lloyd tried to say on Monday, he said he wasn't very sure. He didn't know what was happening with, uh, he he's not good at math. But um, I'm not good at math. Yeah, yeah, but math doesn't. Does it, you don't need a. You don't need math. I'm sure maybe there's some sort of thing, but it's, oh, well, if Tyler you're, works there, you're not. You're not doing any equations or anything like quadratic that. Quadratic formula. Yeah, you're not, you're not doing the Pythagorean theorem or oh, anything nice. like that. Like that. Um, and if you're interested, right? These guys are based out of Lafayette. They do a lot of work. They are uh, very experienced in the industry. They've you know been doing it for their entire lives. And uh, if you're interested and you need any help or you want somebody to do a uh, project for you. Call Tyler of the Day at 318-229-5585. Again, the number is 318-229-5585. They are based out of Lafayette, but they will travel. They will come to you, and they are they're very good people. They're upstanding people, and they, uh, they do a very good job. So our friends at FCO Development, Mikey Ask Mikey Mitch, is brought to you by our friends at FCO Development. Like hell, maybe you're gonna have. Are you gonna have a Heineken Silver for the game? Maybe. I don't want one now. You gonna shotgun another one? You want another? I don't know if you should shotgun because we saw how that went last time. You oh, no, I, I feel know. like you gotta redeem yourself. Yeah, you yeah, have a drink. I don't think you should shotgun. The way okay, it went. I'll, I'll, I'll I think, you should, I think you should chug it. But maybe not shotgun it. The way it went last time. It's, yeah, I can do. I mean, I can sip. do anything. I know. All right, fuck it. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Go for it. There. Oh, that's much better. One, two. Open, three, open it up a little bit. You four, know what I mean? 
five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Nine. Okay. So 10, now it's starting to drip. 11, now you're struggling a little bit. Twelve. It's pretty good. Thirteen. Not bad. I'll give you Not a bad. Ah. Twelve and a half seconds. There. How was it? Good. Delicious. You can't do that. With a regular one. With a regular one. Oh, you can only do that <laughs> with the silver. No. The silver. Why? Because the silver's lighter. Can you hear me? It's got lighter. 35 calories. It's pretty um, crisp. Like, that's not even, that wasn't even cold. I know you don't really, you don't Wait. necessarily need a cold beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was room temp. No, I think we did. Did you, did you, did you which bathroom did you use? I can literally hear the toilet. Oh, yeah. Officer, I'm fine. You've been looking. You've been around. You've been around. Straight line, kid. Yeah. You've been around. Show next time. It's just breakfast. It's a very good beer. No, I can hear the toilet. Flush. Easy to drink. Easy to drink. Easy to pour. Easy to pour. <laughs> but it's something that, you know, I think it should be in the rotation at, at tailgates, especially with LSU baseball coming up. We'll get into some of the LSU baseball conversation. Welcome back to Mic'd Up. You know, I don't like that. Welcome back to Mic'd Up. I appreciate you staying with us for the break. We are now in the Ask Mikey and Mitch portion of the show. It's the seventh hour. Mikey and Mitch, Ask Mikey and Mitch is brought to you by FCO Sol- Solutions. F-co no, really? FCO Development. Just FCO Development. Really? It's brought to you by FCO Development. They have all your FCO, uh, all your development solutions. And they have all your solutions. Yeah, all your solutions. FCO Development <laughs> is a civil construction company that specializes in new multifamily construction. They specialize in dra- site drainage, site utilities, earthworks, site clearing, house pads, ponds, demo work, and hurricane cleanup. They are really good people. They're based out of Lafayette. Uh, they do work everywhere. They've been in the industry for a really long time. Great people. Please give them a call. If you're interested and you need some help, you need some, you have any of this types of things that they specialize in interest you, call our friend Tyler today at 318-229-5585. Again, the number is 318-229-5585. I think Lloyd has said that if you can beat him on the golf course, you get a free... Not me. Oh, he said that. Yeah, no, you got to beat Tyler. You don't Tyler said, no, Ty, you said that or Tyler gave that promo? Yeah, Tyler gave that Tyler promo. said if you can beat him on the golf course, he'll give you a free um I would say, yeah, if you job. beat me, that, that, free that, job. you know, I don't work for that. Yeah. yeah. But our, our friend at FCO Development is, uh, give Keep him a call. Day. Give him a call. Tyler of the day. All right. Our show, our next segment is Ask Mikey Mitch, which play is brought little, to you by FCO Development. Play a little Development. member guest in, at Oakhorn in I'm May. So I'm put I'm it on the calendar. I'm happy for you. I should be able to do the show, then bounce. Yep. Boy, member guest is on a Saturday. Yeah, I think it starts. I think Friday, Friday and Friday Saturday. practice round. So, so you yeah. won't be able to. You'll be you'll be gone that day. It's okay. We'll, we'll get a fill in for you. So we have Jake from Stat Farm here. There we go. There we go. All right. I told you. The, I think we're, we'll figure out something else. Uh, all right. Oh ask, Mike, ask Mikey and Mitch. Do you want to start with the Twitter questions, or you want to start with one from the chat? I'm gonna start with uh, the ones from the chat. No, we're going to so, go, we're alternate. We, yeah, yeah, we but we start alternate. with the boys. We have a ton that have come in. So appreciate everybody <clears> contributing <throat> to this segment because it makes our job very easy. And it gives you all a little bit of a, you know, insight into some guys that are pretty smart about baseball. So first one up, Josh Knoll. Sending it in now. Oh, oh, hold on. I forgot I moved it to four. Here we go. From Josh Knoll. Ask him and him, is Ben DePolt worth it to keep it on the lineup with his with that defense, with the defense that he's able to play? Obviously, uh, y'all have gone through this before, I feel like, where you've had some substitutions that you brought in to kind of defense for offense in the case. So, I don't know. Like you said, J. Mitch, we haven't seen enough of him to really know maybe what he's capable of offensively, but it seems like he's in that nine-hole role where he's... Right. You want to be able to handle the bat, want to um, get guys over with, get over, all those types of things. I'm... I think it's worth it right now to keep him in that situation. Now, I want you to keep in mind, when Tommy White become, is able to throw the baseball again, he will probably slot back into that third base spot, which will then make 
Trey Morgan go to first base, which will then open up an outfield spot yeah. for another outfielder, maybe Paxton Kling or somebody else. So, you know, I don't think that, you know, Napolt's going to be there all year as a starting third baseman. And if he is, and yeah. if, if, uh, if, if Tommy White is the DH the rest of the year, then that's fine. But I think that he's not going to be. I think that he's going to be come back and be the third baseman. And then at that point, you figure it out. But right now, I think it is worth it to keep him in that de- in, in, in the lineup because of his defense. And he's a lefty bat. And it's always nice to have a, a, another lefty in the lineup. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh... – I think you hit that on the head. I think I, I foresee Tommy sliding back into that third base spot pretty soon. If not, I love what Ben does on defense. And if the offense itself, if he has to or does stay at third, I think the offense itself will come around and be well productive enough to where his defense will be very, very, very valuable to this lineup. Um, but I, I do think that there's a very high, all right, chance that Tommy's going to end up sliding back in third. You'll see more Paxton back in the outfield once we'll move it back that way. Well, and think about, I think that's how the lineup's going to go. Think about our team in 09, right? Hanover played third base for the majority of the season because off, you know, he was good defensively. He was still good defensively. Offensively, yeah. he was a step up above Derek Helenihi. Derek Helenihi, I think, was yeah. our, probably our best defender outside of Austin Nola <laughs> in the infield. And Derek Helenihi was playing third base in Omaha because of that part of his game. So. Yeah. You know, yeah. at that that, that season, didn't work out for for all. Yeah, it didn't work yeah. out at all. That season, that season, there was two big moves made. One was before the postseason started. One was during the postseason. There was four defense, right? Austin going to short, yeah. moving DJ to second, and then right there putting um, Helenihi at third base. So putting Shimp and then putting Shimp in the outfield yep, too. Yep, for sure. So you know, I think that there's there is definitely a, a spot for him in the lineup right now, and then. You know, once like you said, once Tommy White comes back, they figure it out and they move from there. But right now, I think it's it's okay. Um, all right, yeah. so I'm gonna go read one from. And it might not just be right now. I think it. I think it could be a you know for right. He may be okay for the year type of thing. We just don't right. know. But I, I do think his defense so far has been good enough to where it, it deserves a spot if the lineup can keep banging. Yeah, and now, and maybe they say, okay, Gavin, you're gonna go back to left, and we're gonna put Napolt at second. And just I, I don't right. know if they're going to do that either, but that's you know that's also an option. Um, all yeah. right. Oh, so I can read him. I got him pulled up. Oh, you have him on the on the chat yeah, and yeah. on the. Uh... I just got him in the document. So this is at um, at Jason P Armstrong who sent the uh, sent the question in from Twitter. Do you want to give? Do you want to give up the shutdown ability of Floyd and Little late in games for them to be used in starting roles? Jay, you want to go the first on this one? I'm on the train of hell no. I love them in the back end of the bullpen. I love Christian Little's ability so far through the year to kind of be the wild card and kind of bounce around. Um, I do think Coop. I do think Coop has got an ability to actually be very, very, very not like serviceable, like legit more than serviceable. Right? You're just not seeing quote unquote crazy numbers that like you're seeing around the league right now with the 95 plus in the fastball and all of this stuff. But I do think his ability to pitch and his ability to get out in that Saturday spot if he stays there is well above what you need. Um, obviously, what you, you got what you got on Friday nights, and I think we're going to figure out that Sunday slash whatever situation. Yeah, I, I really like those guys that knowing that we can bring them in, bring them in through the back end of a game and kind of shutting games down. And I think as the season goes to, teams start to feel that when guys like that do those type of things and then those numbers start to kind of rack up and they start to see – Oh, this guy in the back end of the bullpen has got twice as many strikeouts as innings thrown. He hasn't blown a save. Like, it's going to be tough. Yeah, right, like, I think teams right. really start to feel that as opposed to trying to find another guy to do it who is not proven that do it. And next thing you know, you don't know what you got back there. Yeah. So I like them back there. So I'm glad you said that because I'm kind of on the opposite end of it. Not totally, but a little bit on the opposite end of the sense of you have two guys that kind of have the same <clears> role <throat> right now. I think I don't think you need both of those guys in that role, right? Like if you want Christian Little to be that that stopper, that guy that comes in whenever you want, all right, make him be that guy. But I think that if you have one of those guys shows you the ability to have that shutdown ability for an extended period of time in the game, then I think that they've earned their way into the starting rotation. I don't know if there's a spot right now. I think as of now, you allow them to keep doing what they're doing until there's a spot that opens up either in the midweek or – the weekend, you put one of those guys as a starter. But 
seems like Jay likes having both guys in the back end right now and being able to go out and throw multiple innings and whichever one didn't throw the other one close it. So I'm not against it, but I think that if you can, if one of them can separate themselves and put them more in there and have another depth as a starting pitcher, then, you know, I think that's, that's very beneficial. I don't think you need both of them doing the same things. Here, and, and you're not wrong, but I guess my thought process of it is you're not used to seeing two guys that could kind of extend it and are kind of, and are kind of be at the back end of it. Right. And so my thought process is if, if we have Friday and Saturday taken care of and we get to Sunday, say we, for whatever reason, can't figure out the Sunday spot, which I truly don't think is going to be the situation. But let's just say that is, right? If you can't figure out the Sunday spot and now you got these two guys in the back where one can, they both can extend or both can end, well, they both can throw multiple times on the weekend and one can be extended and the other one can be short and then the next one, one can be extended and the other one can be short. You're kind of bridging that Sunday opportunity right there if the Sunday right, starter right. somehow doesn't come out blazing. So right. I, I love the opportunity of them being able to be there. All right. Lloyd? All right, next one up coming in from, oh, oh Bond, James Bond. I thought it was Barry. That would have been nice too, but I think he was <laughs> Wait, Is he though? Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay, from James Bond. Is Tanks maybe more injured than Wait, they first thought? Wait, where's it up here? Oh, hold on, I know what I did. I added another one. I was trying to get creative over here. Okay, anyway, question is, I'll figure it out. In the, in the, well, I'll pull up, uh, pull up the next question. Is Tanks, Tommy Tanks, maybe more injured than we first thought? No, I don't think so. I think that, um, I guess my, I have a follow-up question. Is like, why, what makes you think that? But my question would my, – my answer is no, I don't think so. I think that from the minute that he got back on, we kind of understood that it's just throwing shoulders, so it's going to take him some time to get back on the field as far as defense, the defense goes. Offensively, man, I think he's okay. Like, he's pressing a little bit right now. I don't think the injury has anything to do with his bat right now and the way he's not getting hits. He had a big double. He had a nice double yesterday. He fought off some pitches, fought off some stuff. And it's just he doesn't have a ton of at-bats. And sometimes it takes some guys a little longer to get going early in the season than others. And, you know, I think I think Tanks, everybody saw what he did last year, and they want that to happen. Like, last year was hard, it's hard to do multiple years in a row. And I'm not saying he's not going to. I think he's going to. He just needs to get some time to get hot and uh, and kind of get, get, get the rhythm of the season. Uh, I'm going to go with, yeah, I think he is, because I personally expected him to be back at third base a little sooner than it has been. Look, I get it. It hasn't been very long, so they're obviously, you know, being cautious about it. Um, but I, I'll say, yeah. But as far as for the bat, I don't think it's really affecting him at the plate that much right now. But what I do think it is is that he realizes he's missed some games. He's real, He realizes some other guys may have, may have a couple homers in here and there. And I think he's pressing just a little bit. I think he's – very, 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 like, overly aggressive kind of early in these counts and not kind of, like, letting the game really come to him right now. And I think once he gets back to kind of taking a deep breath and letting the game come to him a little bit more, I think he'll start to get on the roll and get going. Yep. I like that. It's two in a row. We've, we've kind of been on the opposite ends. It's good. Well, then the only thing. Yeah, that, there you go. The only thing that I We can be like Skip and Stephen A and really start fighting each other yeah, if you want to do that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Y'all got, got the <laughs> dynamic already. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would say about it is – what, what, in the at-bat where he hit the double, you could see that he was, I wouldn't say pressing, but he was honed in on trying to be able to get. Well, he's he being was being super aggressive. That's what I'm saying. He was super yeah. aggressive. It felt like he was seeing the ball out of his hand well, where he kind of was in a good spot where it felt like he was going to get a hit. Yeah, so I, I mean, don't know if that's a way to turn the page for him or well, whatever. What, they, what I've noticed, they're pounding him in. They're pounding him hard inside. Like, mm. they are, I knew you were going to go that way. They are, they are like, a lot of those balls that he was fouling off, he was like trying to buggy whip, and he was really getting the bat through the zone and trying to fight him off. And these balls, like you had, you had some guy with, yeah, one of the righties last night had a lot of run, and so he was throwing these two seamer sinkers in off his hands. And so guys are trying to, they're they're challenging him, but they're coming in off of the plate. And I think that if he tries to calm himself, now that's the hardest thing to do in baseball is to calm yourself down at the plate and let the game come to you and not kind of I, I give in. Clock. Was that? Say I eat pitch clock. Yeah, I eat pitch clock. Right, but like if you if you say okay, listen, I'm going up there with a plan. This is where I'm going to look at. I'm going to look. I'm going to, if this is where guys are throwing at throwing to me, I am not going to swing at that. I'm going to make him get over the plate. And so, like you said, I think he just needs to be a little bit more patient. I think he's probably pressing a little bit. It has nothing to do with talent. Nothing to do with ability. I'm not worried about him. I think yeah. he's going to rake. I think you're going to look at him at the end of the year and he's going to have you know 20 homers or whatever. And 
you know, he's going to go through one of those stretches where all he's doing is hitting a home run. I, I'll tell you what, his best friend, too, is where I do think, let's just say he was back at NC State, he may feel more pressure because he is – one without a doubt bona fide D guy in that lineup, right? right? I do think coming here is going to if he realizes and understands where he's at, it's gonna there is so much help around him in that lineup, it's gonna allow him to, hey, look, let the game come to you. All right. You're going to get it. We know what you can do. We know what kind of hitter you are. You don't have to be the guy. Look around you. Look at that lineup. It's stacked. Right? Just get back to yourself by playing your game. You don't have to try to hit a homer every pitch. You don't have to it doesn't have to be like that. You can let the game come to you, take your three doubles off the wall, and then it kind of turns into the next week four homers. Like, it's coming, you know? Like that. Hey, I think next for next week, we're not done with Ask Mikey and Mitch. I think for next week, we should add the phone number. Get so the call in? That's a third, the third way, either through Twitter, through our show, like through the, uh, <clears throat> the chat, or call in live or leave a message for the night before, the day before. And yeah. if you leave a message with your email, I'll send you a video call and you can hop in. There you go. If you're that bold. There you go. All right. Ooh. Oh, no, I don't know. Video call, that's a little tricky. That's a little tricky. That's a little tricky. Ooh. That's, a lot, that's a lot going on with just one man, man one man band doing this thing. But we're working on it. All right, next one. Four jobs. Four jobs. Yep. Four jobs. Got a five tool player. Uh, next one up here from <laughs> Corey K. Should – oh, don't let me do it like this. Yes. Should we be concerned about the team's amount of strikeouts? And this is a question that we've gotten a lot, so I don't want to harp on all of them. But right. this is one that's been popping up a good bit. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. But yeah, still we talked about it a little early on. Yeah. I'm not, I think I'm we not, touched on a lot bit, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not necessarily concerned with the strikeouts. I think that, you know, it's still super early in the season. I think that's just one of those things that you have to kind of get ironed out. I think that most of the strikeouts have come in two of these games that we have, we have played. Do, you know, do I want them uh, to, to not strike out as much? Of course. But I think that you know they're 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 having they have a ton of walks. They're getting on base. It's not like they're just striking out and not getting on base. I think that it's gonna eventually start to even itself out and kind of level out. Um, it's just one of those things. Strikeouts come in bunches. Homers come in bunches. And you know right now I think they're in that stretch. I'd rather it happen now than later. Uh, boom! I think he hit it on the head. If it was just strikeouts without any kind of production and or walks and or ability to actually get on base still, yeah, I'd be I'd be worried. Because that's a trend. That's not just that's not just a right now thing. That's something that can kind of stick throughout the year. Just like we right. talked about last year when we saw the defense struggling so much, and we we're like, "Yo, this is not a no defense struggles this much." Like this, this team is still getting on base. They're still hitting the ball well. Obviously, it's coming with some strikeouts. I do think the strikeouts go down. I do think some of these younger guys kind of grow up a little bit, you know, so to speak, and they kind of mature a little bit as the season kind of goes. And these at bats get a little bit better. And I do think the older guys are going to kind of carry the torch and, you know, really put the at-bats together to kind of show these guys how to do this thing and, and bring it along. But I don't, I'm not worried about them right now. I'm really not. No doubt. All right, next one up from Kirk Land Landrino. Bang, boom, on the screen. Ask him and them. I'd like their explanation on what goes into the decision where batters stand horizontally in relation to the plate, working crowds, and, he's, and he says that Dylan Cruz is more in the middle of the plate. Oh, like as far as in the box? Like, yeah, like where the arm it just It just kind of depends on preference. Like, I, I liked – I had always had my back foot on the back. Like, I just knew where I wanted to be in the box. And for me, my back foot was already – I was always on the back part of the box. You know, maybe about, you know, six inches from the back line. And then my front foot was, like, where that first little, it's a like – uh, Huh? Six inches is a long way, Coach. <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> but, yeah. I like my front foot, like by that first little triangle part, like of the plate, and then you know that was kind of I knew where I, that was a good way for me to gauge where I was at, right? And then, um, yeah, I mean, so that that's that's on me. That's it's, I think it's a preference thing. The they've always said the further back you are in the plate, the longer you have to see the ball. Like it doesn't make that much of a difference, right? Like if a guy's just throwing like flipping stuff up, maybe you move up in the box. If a guy likes to come in a lot hard into you with hard sinkers, maybe you back off the plate a little bit. There's different strategies for different things. It's all about preference. Jay? Uh, yeah, I was I was one to kind of that thought process. I wanted as long as I could to see the ball. So, like, it didn't really matter if you were 89 or 99. I was I was literally trying to push the catcher back. Like, I was testing that water. I kind of tried to scratch out the back line. I like the thought process of being in the same spot because I feel like 90 to 99, it's kind of the same feeling. I didn't want to be, oh, I think this guy's throwing 90. Let me move up in the box. There's nothing. And all of a sudden, I'm moving back. And now my timing feels a little bit off, 
right? I'm not right on the barrel of where I wanted to be. So I didn't like that idea. And I kind of like the thought process too of if I happen to the further back you are in a box sometimes kind of gives the illusion that you didn't go. And so I kind of like that thought process as well. But, yeah, it's really a personal preference thing. It's kind of wherever you wherever you feel. Now, For me it, to move up in the box, it would literally take a, a shit flipper, like yeah. a legit I, – I got nothing. Like Mikey likes to call him the poo slinger. So, like, that's what it would yeah. take. So I mean, that and like if they, if they end up going to the automatic strike zones – you're gonna see a lot of guys start to move up in the box because that's yeah that's, yeah. that's they're gonna yeah. start catching the ball in front of the plate. But I think it's a preference yeah. thing. All right. Well, and my only like I guess thought on that would be with somebody that you saw in what the first five last night that has that splitter where you want to maybe move up and try to get on top of it. But the fact that he throws 97 and mm-hmm. has that nasty split. Really not doing yourself any yeah, favors. Yeah. So I there. think that at that point you say, yeah, okay, I'm gonna look not, at a pitch at this part of the zone. Right. I about to say, if that's the case, if you're going to move up and try to hit the splitter, then you're basically telling me that you're spitting on every fastball you've yep. seen. You're okay with being two strikes and watching 99 right down the middle and not even Ooh. thinking about swinging. That's that's kind of basically what you're telling me at right. that point. And if that's your and that's, that's okay. Your approach, and that's okay. Re- no, 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 no. If that's your approach, I really hope you don't miss the splitter me too. that you get. That's all I'm saying. You're 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 <laughs> ba- you're banking on a pitch that's harder to hit. But if that's your approach and you stick with your approach and you're stubborn to your approach. Okay, I can live with that if that's what you want yeah. to do. But show me that you can hit the but, splitter. But, it, but it's but there's so many layers to it too because it's also hard for me to it's also hard for me to get behind that thought process in a situation like last night when hey how many at bats do you have against this guy? Oh wait, none. And you're gonna tell me that you're sitting on his splitter right. because he's because it's good. Right. I, I'm I'm off that. Like you gotta have some extensive history with the guy for me for you to come back in and be like yeah I was sitting on a splitter because I wanted to hit it. I knew it was good I know it drops and I well that means I hope you had 10 15 20 20 at bats against him already right not this is my first time ever seeing him right you know so like it there's a there's a there's layers to that as well you know all right all right next question Ed from LT from Roblox I think that's uh I don't know if that's like shout out Kanye and Kim because obviously and Ray J if you want to put her in the mix but LT from Roblox how hey, do you think uh, El- did you do this on purpose? Yeah, put it on the screen. Well, not with a little like little thing. Well, no, what well, see, so what happened what had happened is the ones that come in with the screen are from VMix social. Oh, see so one from here. And so these are I'll copy and paste them and put them into the Okay. Into the, I see what you're doing. Yeah, okay. just, just so you can still see them on the screen. All right. But LT from Roblox. Yeah, we just saw it on Roblox. How do you think LSU could piece together these hits and not leave a ton of base runners on obviously on base? You saw that a lot, I guess. This is a little bit of recency bias, I would imagine, from what you saw last night. And just Saturday. Think, yeah, I think it was a lot of just filth. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you you go into a pitching staff that's got good that, – that's just kind of – they're feeling themselves and they're, they're doing everything, they're executing the right way. More if, if the pitcher executes exactly how he wants to execute more times than not, they're going to have more success than the hitters. That's just the way it is. You know, I'd be, I'd be discouraged if LSU wasn't getting guys on base, right, and if they were just kind of – flying through the lineups and you only had a couple guys on base every few innings, but now they're getting guys on base. They're getting opportunities to drive these guys in and they haven't done it yet. I think that that's going to change. I think that it's too early in the season to panic on that. Now, if you get through a month and a half of the season, you get through 20 games and they're still doing this. All right, now we got to figure out why we're not driving these guys in. But as of now, I think it's too early to panic. If we weren't getting guys on, I'd be more nervous. We are getting guys on. I think that that's going to happen. So I'm a, I'm gonna tap into the numbers right here a little bit, and go, I get it. Stats. It's super, Stat it's boy. super early, right? So like, so like, don't don't do don't do too much with the numbers, but we gotta chill with the thought process of like, oh man, we're not getting hits with guys on, or oh man, we're striking out and we punching out a lot. We got of guys that are playing every day, pretty much. So guys that have probably five starts or more, yeah, five starts or more. We got two guys. Three guys hitting under 270. One of them's Trey Morgan. You think he's going to be there the whole year? Right. I don't. Right. So my point to it is, is like, don't don't get so keen in on I guess the the two games you saw where they struggled. They're still seven and one. They're still hitting very well as a team. Watch the just stay into it as a whole. You know, like it, we we can't get so microscoped on just the one little thing or when you see it happen and now we just keep nitpicking and nitpicking and nitpicking on it. It took us a long time to get on the, hey, this team's very bad at defense last year. Take the same approach with the hitting in the clutch. Take the same approach with the, the strikeouts. Take the same approach with all of that. Give it some time. It's yep. been seven games. 
they have, we haven't even got to a 10 game mark. It's been seven games. Yeah. Give us some time. We, we just fine. All right, next one up, coming from Robert Playson. Ask him and him. Who do you think starts Monday's game? Ooh, that's a good one because next week's a little tricky. You got um, – I mean, you clearly knew the schedule. You have four games over the weekend plus a midweek game plus the weekend <coughs> series next weekend. So you have, you have a lot of games in a short amount of time. I would imagine – Robert, did you send this from jail? This looks like a mug shot. <laughs> I mean, a commissary must be good for this guy. I would imagine. I would imagine that you have <laughs> Ty Floyd start the Monday game. Yeah. So I was gonna. I was gonna say. I don't. I'm not sure Thatcher will throw that day, and simply because I know he's coming off the injury, he's not super extended yet, and that would be on what one day's less rest. Yeah. So they're I'm not sure they want to do that schedule. to him. Yeah, I'm not sure they want to do that to him yet. So I think if you don't see him on Monday. I think that's more the reason why more than anything else that there might be. So Ty Floyd would be a good guess. Um, I really don't know, but that would be a good guess to me. Or you might see one of these other young guys kind of get the ball yeah. in that situation, especially based off of what they do, you know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Only reason I say Ty Floyd is because I think that he's going to want the starter to go at least five innings because they play. They do have another midweek game on th- on Wednesday, yeah. and they don't want to be able to. They don't want to say, okay, we're going to piece this thing together and then lose their bullpen guys. By Wednesday, but, yeah, but but then what if you? But then here's a here's a question: though. What if you get seven out of Skeens on Friday, seven out of Riley on Saturday? Yeah, yeah. Then, that, then you, there's then a lot that, of arms yeah, available, right? Then that you know, so it. yeah, that's why I said kind of depends. But I I don't I for one I would be I'd be shocked if we saw Thatcher on on Monday. Yeah, me too, me too. All right, next question coming in from Sports Guy three one five. I'm sure your Twitter is totally clean. Um, Ack and Little looked like a possible nasty one two punch coming out of the pen. Akin Little looked like a possible nasty like, one two punch coming out of the pin late. He didn't finish his question. Is there a question there? Yeah, it, it was more of a statement. So I guess he's asking more of What do we think about them coming yeah, out of the pin? Yeah, is, yes. is that going to be kind of the situation in which you saw I last think, year in, in a sense? I think that you have. Jay, you, you go first on this one. Um, I, I wasn't expect, I was actually surprised at how much they were able to extend uh, Ackenhausen on what is second or third outing of the year. Super positive, though. The guy showed his ability to get out lefties and righties, so that's awesome, too. Um, yeah, I mean, they look great. I love the fact that we have, for sure, one, if not maybe more, I guess, very effective left-handed arms out of the pen right now, which is hard to find on any roster, much less a college roster. So I think that part of it's been great. I think Christian Little has been the, the unsung hero of the pitching staff so far this year, honestly, because of his versatility and his sheer performance of what, he, of what he's done this year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm 100% in agreement with you. What they've done so far, I, I, I'm liking a lot. And I think they're actually leading the team in, like, average against right now yeah, of all I mean, our pitchers. So I, like, that I, says I've a been, lot. I've been super... They actually are. Are they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Little's uh, 053 and Ackenhausen's 095 against right now. It's pretty impressive. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm I'm very impressed with. I think anytime you have a lefty coming out the out of the bullpen that you can rely on to get lefties out, and that you have a go to lefty out the pen, I think that's huge. I think that they they could potentially have two of those guys because Griffin Herring looked really good when he threw um, on Sunday, and obviously and Christian. That's assuming that's assuming that Coop stays in the, the rotation. rotation right now too. Right, so right. And then, on, you know, Christian Little came in with a lot of fanfare. He had a lot of talent. He had a little cleanup deal with bone spurs in his elbow. He's obviously yeah. healthy. He was throwing 97 um, last night. And so, you know, he came in with a lot of fanfare and a lot of talent, and I, I believe that he's obviously living up to that. So having those guys out the pen, listen, LSU has an embarrassment of riches in, in the pitching with their pitching staff right now, and that's a huge advantage to them, and that's a great – problem to have is you know, who's going to throw what days because you have so many guys that you're confident in throwing out there what i didn't know if jared was going to respond all right from no, no, lewis, i mean i already did there you go from Landon lewis asked mike up what's the weekend rotation look like for the a&m series which is two two weekends away, two weekends away. um two weekends away honestly i believe it's going to be like you see it here today I think they're going to yeah. give Thatcher a couple is. more weekend, think, weeks of midweek starts. I think it's going to stay the same like it is right now, and I think, yeah, I think it's staying the same way it is unless, right now, honestly. 
Unless Riley has another rough outing on Saturday, you may think see him make a change. But he yeah. trusts. He's confident in that guy. He trusts him. I'm, I'm confident in him, and I think he's going to give him the benefit of the doubt and allow him to work us through. I don't think that you're going to see an outing like you saw last week again this uh, this Saturday. I think I think for it to change, I think a lot of Riley would have to go wrong, and I think Thatcher's next outing would have to be very very good and pretty extended for him to be like, all right, we should make this change. Yeah. All right. All right. Next one up. Obviously, a lot of things are being asked about the strike uh, about the strikeout numbers. I think we've already hit on the strikeout. Me too. Um, so from yeah, this- from Barry Wall, my biggest takeaway is about Coach Jay Johnson. Can you get any bigger confirmation of the mindset of every game matters? Every, every game matters. Tiger baseball is in great hands, in my uneducated opinion. That's his words, not mine. Yeah, of course, every game matters, and I think I don't think that's a I don't think he's doing anything any differently than other coaches that have come through here. I think every coach that yeah. has been through here believes that every game matters. They want to win every single game, and uh, I think right now. He's got the ability to go and make up these these matchups and have these substitutions because of the depth in the team that he has and the talent that he has on his team. So I don't think that um, he's doing anything different. I think that it's a great thing to have, though. Like, I agree with you. I think that what he does, him loving baseball, him loving this team, him him wanting to win and being so committed to winning is a huge thing for this team, and um, it's only going to get better. So, and look, I'm not discounting where Jay's mindset was last year because I don't know. But I do know, like remembering Paul in the past and other coaches too as well, Paul was an RPI freak, right? And when you have to play against teams without good RPIs and you lose, it hurts you a lot. And when you play against teams with good RPIs and you win, it helps you a lot. And as far as for seeding and where you go and how the postseason kind of plays out. So I do know – listening to Jay mention RPI on Monday and stuff like that, this is a thought that's in his mind early on in the season again. And I think there may be a heightened sense of, you know, thought of how that can help them out through the year as they, you know, go through a tough SEC schedule of what it is. But with that being said, those are very, very, very strong reasons as to why you approach every game as how much they matter and why you try to win every game that you're actually out there because at the end of it, they all matter, and they all could help put you in a better position to be successful once the postseason starts. Yep. All right. Next one up from we got a, we got a lot more in the YouTube chat. We just we just funneled through our Twitter. Yeah. Now we're in the chat. Now we're in so the chat. So just let's rattle off some ones that we haven't talked about. That's what I'm doing. Um, I'm okay. filtering them up for you from Jay Reach. About five more minutes of this. Okay. Jay Reach, who's the best player on the team to protect Cruz? Joe Bear being behind him and having the worst K percentage could be scary. Rather rather see him in like the six hole. Um, I mean, I think that I, I know why he has Joe Bear right now because Joe Bear was kind of hot and he's a lefty, and you want you want to have that matchup uh, deal. But um, I mean, I think that I think eventually I think Tommy White's gonna be right behind him, right? I think that's like, if if everything works out the way that you chalk like if it if it's the way that you draw it up, Tommy White's gonna be the guy protecting Dylan Cruz. Yeah, I uh, so I think. You're 100% right. I think Tommy White's the guy you're going to see that's that's going to end up there and he's going to be there for the long run of the season. But I do think having Joe Bear out of the six hole and into a five hole, maybe sometimes a two or a one or whatever it is, is going to help him immensely. And it's going to help that lineup out more. I do think the one person right now who's in some sort of a sacrificial lamb-ish, lamb-ish spot, but not really. I mean, like he's in the middle of the lineup and exactly where I would expect him to be is Jones. And I think Jones' success is going to do a lot with what we get out of Thompson offensively and out of Brady Neal offensively, because that's going to allow him to get more pitches to get to, to more chances to get pitched to and not pitch quote unquote around, if you will. And that's going to help someone as young as him with as much talent and as much power as him. Great. All right. Switching to the pitching side, Landon Lewis again. Is Chase Shores the next Nolura Lang if you had to pick? Listen, I know those are big comparisons. Listen, I'm not. Ooh, wow. I, I can't compare anybody. Anybody to either one of those guys are really good, right? Nola has probably yeah. one of the most decorated college pitchers of all time. If you go look at his college pitching numbers, I mean, he's SC Pitcher of the Year twice. Like he's his numbers are stupid. I think Chase Shores coming in has as much upside as anybody. He has a lot of yeah. ability. He said he had a hundred a few times. 
his last outing. Like, he's got that ability. But let's, you know, I think the, the biggest detriment we can do to a player is compare him to former stars only two starts into his career. I mean, his kid I doesn't even have 10 in- innings pitched yet. And so yeah, we yeah. I love the ability, I love his his the like his talent, but let's let's let let's let this kid make his own path before we start comparing him to some of the all-time greats. Yeah, I you know, I like I you know, very respectfully disagree. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> What's going on? I I think in this one honestly, man, just because of his huge upside and what you see in his actual stuff, he reminds me a lot of a young Gosman. Who, oh, so like you don't agree? You don't disagree with, with me? You disagree with like? Yeah. Okay, the comparison. No, no, no. I dis I disagree with in comparing him. Like at the end of the day, dude, you still got to go out there and do it, and everyone knows that. So that's whatever. But when I see his stuff, it reminds me of just flat, flat out stuff. It reminds me of a young Gosman like coming in, and I'm like, man, that's electric coming from a, a kid that young. So. I see that in him. Now, am I going to sit here and say he's going to have Gosman's career and our Gosman's well, post- here, as, LSU career? Huh, as, I have no clue. I hope he does. I hope for him he does. I hope for LSU he does. But, but he's still got to go out there and do it. For reference, Gosman's freshman year, he had a good freshman year, but it wasn't elite. Right now, he's a draft no, eligible no, no. sophomore. The next year, he was elite and got drafted fourth overall or fifth overall, whatever but the it was. Radar gun lit, but the radar no, gun no, no, was, no was no lighting doubt. up from the day he stepped on campus. No doubt. So, no doubt. Uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll wrap up with this one from Nick Keller. Ask Mikey and Mitch, what will the field look like again when Tommy White starts playing third base? Kind of hit on this a little bit. Um, I, I think it's more, this yeah. kind of brings me to more of what you do with Trey Morgan and left. You saw him kind of track down a ball. You saw him make a, I don't want to say a bad play at first, but he's a, he's a, a, do, wasn't no, a, he's a do or die guy. Like that's how he plays. The, that's how he plays every position, wherever, wherever you put him. He thinks he can make every play on the field. You saw him last year when he slid into the tarp, pops up, throws the second, and you're like, there's not a lot of people that can do that. And so I don't have a problem. I, I'm actually shocked that they moved him to left, but it makes sense for the lineup. So I think that's more of where this question goes, is how do you kind of figure the lineup around Trey and where I mean, you put him in the field defensively? I mean, I think that you put Trey at first. If you're confident enough with your young outfielders to put him back out there, I mean, listen, Pearson hasn't played. Yeah. Right, so like you have guys there that have the ability that have shown you that they can play the outfield and be really good in the outfield. So I think that you you're more confident and you've seen the track record of guys in the outfield more so than you have in the infield. So I think that Tommy goes to third. I think Trey comes back to first. I think you take Jared Jones and you put him back at DH, and then you allow that left field spot to either be, um, you know, whatever outfielder you want out there: Paxton Kling, Pearson. If you want to move. Do God back out to left, and now you open up the second base spot. If you want uh, Nipple in there if, if that much, I think then you can put him at second. I don't know, but you have options. I think the move is to move Trey back from left to first and move Jared Jones back to DH, and then you figure out that outfield spot. Yeah, I think uh, I think this this weekend with being a four games in four days, and then you're going to get actually five games in five days, right? Because they're going to play next Tuesday as well, right? Wednesday. Wednesday. Five games, Wednesday. In, five okay, games so in six five days. Five games in six days, and then you go into a weekend series. I think keep an eye on this week because I think it'll be huge, and I don't think all those at-bats or whatever will come from the left field spot. But I do think when Tommy is healthy again, he goes back to third. I think Trey comes back to first. I think Jones goes back to DH. And I think you get a chance – over what he probably sees out of these guys over the next two weeks. I think you get a chance to see Paxton and Pearson, uh, Kling and Pearson kind of battle it out and for an opportunity to – for an extended opportunity to take kind of reins of that left field spot. That's what I do think so ends up happening. I agree. All right, that wraps it up for – Ask Mikey and Mitch. I appreciate that. Ask him and him. Ask Mikey ask, and Mitch. Ask him and him. Ask him and him. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's going to be an eight mile too. <laughs> Ask him and him presented by FCO Solutions. Nope. Development. FCO Development. Uh, we appreciate all the questions. It's every week has gotten better and better. Every week we've gotten more and more. I'm sorry if we can't get yeah. to your questions. We're trying. It's just you know <clears throat> we have to at some point shut the show down. So uh, appreciate it. Keep doing it. We're gonna keep having it. I don't imagine that the questions are gonna get ramped up as the season gets ramped up. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, let's get to the seggies. 
Let's get to the segments. Buffer guy. Buffer guy. Yeah. <laughs> Mistake of the day is brought to I you by... I thought you were going to intro it. Guy. Mistake of the day is brought to you by our friends down at Doe's E-Place. Right? This is Lloyd's segment. So, Lloyd, take it away. All right. The mistake of the day brought to, Bay you Bay. By, brought to you by Doe's Eat Place. I was conflicted between two, right? So we had two options here, one of which was kind of debunked on on Twitter by Taylor Lewan himself with the garbage bags. He's like, bro, I just asked the guy to give him my stuff. I don't give a shit if he puts some that's, garbage that, bags. Was, that, uh, so, when, you, when I saw this, I was like, okay, that's what usually what happens. Like, what do you want me to do? Fold it up, put it in a nice suitcase, and have it hand like, like no. Like, right, that's, that's not what he how says. Like, I didn't expect him to roll out like a chariot for me. He's yeah. like, I just wanted my shit back because I'm still trying to play football. Not a big deal. So then, whenever you saw what happened with the former UGA defensive lineman, and it's not so much, I don't want to, obviously, everything's alleged. It's alleged. Jalen Carter. He says he's off. But my more mistake of the day is whoever leaked this story right before he goes to the podium for, NFL, for the NFL Combine makes him leave and go back to Georgia because there's an arrest warrant out for him. So he does the, the only thing that you can do, right? Which is, you have to go. I'm not trying to evade the law. I'm, it's, not a, it's not a federal case. It's a you know, state-by-state case basis. So he has a Georgia... Or, yeah, Georgia arrest warrant out for him. He goes back. He issues a statement saying he'll be cleared of all charges. But my real mistake of the day is messing with this man's life like this. You could have leaked this at any point. You know it happens every year, right? Right. And happens, like, someone always holds on to it. Like, what is the gain that you're going to have by releasing this right now? What, like, some people release the gain because, okay, I want to release because I want money or I want this or I want that or I'm going to extort you. I'm going to do – what is the gain for this? And that's that was my question: is whose mistake was it? Was it somebody that is personally connected with him that was probably like tethered to him, thought he could be an agent, maybe get some money out of some sort of like signing deal? All right, I'll take your draft stock. You saw this happen with Larry B. Tunsil when the gas mask video came out on draft day. But that was his a, a former agent. That, that, that was somebody that he thought was going to be his agent. It, it wasn't like a real agent, I believe. I could be wrong. But so this guy tries to extort him whenever he signed with somebody else. And so he leaks the video. This feels like, in my case, it could be somebody from almost on the NFL side that's trying to tank his draft stock so they can be able to select him later off. Later you on love in the draft. a good conspiracy, don't I you? I mean, that's what I would do if I were in that position. You talking about a little Lyle Collins right there? Yeah, I mean, that was unbelievable, too. Well, Lyle Collins was a little different <laughs> yeah. situation. Well, yeah, I know it was. Yeah. Right, but that yeah, but it could play out the exact same way with with Lyle, the where it's like, sure, I was there. I don't really know how much. I'm the connect- Cowboys did a good job drafting him. The Cowboys don't draft Lyle Collins. He's a free agent, gets to go anywhere he wants. Yes, right. That, so they did the right thing. I'm gonna draft a first round talent in the sixth, in the sixth round and make sure that he's our, on our yeah. team. And so that was the, yeah. that, that was more of the impetus of the does eat place mistake of the day. Maybe a commercial coming soon. Thought it was gonna be today, um, but. We are working on that on the production side. But, however, I think the mistake of the day, or it could be turn out to be an ugly mistake, a glorious, you know, like dog baby for a team that leaks this. They get to see him fall. You get to take Jalen Carter, who's been talked about, rumored being maybe the first overall pick. You get him in the third round, fourth round. Maybe you get him in top ten. But that could be an either-or mistake of the day. But Maybe so. All right. I just thought that was very interesting, that there's a lot of factors at play when you come around draft season. A lot. A lot of new news that comes out, too. God, they really dig into your life, huh? Hey, there's a guy that put $1,000 in um, before the season started. I don't know when. Maybe it was in December. $1,000 on Anthony Richardson to be the number one overall pick in the draft, and it was plus, like, a lot of money. He's going to win. He's probably going to win, like, $75,000 right now or something crazy if he's the number one overall pick. I forgot exactly how much it was, but it was a lot. Mattress Mac? Not Mattress Mac. Mattress Mac probably would put a million if he's going to bet all that. Yeah, but see, I think he, I think he stops at a million, huh? He don't go below that. Yeah, no. when's the last time he won a bet? Oh, he's won some. I mean, his, like... His, his, what he does is brilliant, by the way. It's basically, <clears throat> it's like a... He doesn't... He, he hedges his bet by betting. He hedges... Yeah, he hedges yeah. his mattress sales by betting. Because He's it's, basically it's, running... Like, yeah. Basically running doing, a grift. He's, he's it's he's genius. It's illegal. It should be. It's not yeah. illegal. It's like a charity. It's, it's genius. Five hundred one c three. It's not that either. It's very similar. Not that at all. Tax write off. That's not true. Nah. Keep going. That's all I have to okay. say about that. All right. Current call is brought to you by our friends down at Assured Partners. If you need any insurance. Okay. They okay me, 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 my bosses. 
Dude, can we do commercial insurance down there at Share Partners? We're one of the be- hot, biggest yeah. insurance companies in the country. In the world. Fastest growing in the country. We do a lot of big business stuff. Talk to me if you want to talk about captive. Because I'm good at them. Look, captive. Explain what that Look, is. Captive. I'm not no. going to explain that right now on air. We'll talk about If you want to, you know where to contact me. Yeah. All right, what's yours? Go to show. No, I was going to pull yours up first because I, I have it all Okay, I got to go first. Because Wait, which one are we going to do? It's our boy, Coach Jay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I had two. We forgot the first one that me and Lloyd had talked about before the I'll show. I'll take that one. Okay, there you go. You're welcome. Yep. Uh, my, You're welcome for this one. Yeah, my curtain call. Thank you. My curtain call is, so we talk to Jay a lot. We've become really close with Jay Johnson. Um, you know, he's done a really good job with his team. He's been very open to us. But you don't really see the emotions. Sometimes you see him. Lloyd makes him laugh. I think Lloyd's kind of broke through that. That shell a little bit made him laugh, but you don't really see a lot of emotion on the field. You saw it last night after they won the game with his team, and I thought uh, this deserves a uh, a curtain call. I mean, that's like he's fired up. This one means it means something to him. Like he loves it, and I I respect that. I appreciate that. And thanks for all the fans too. That's great. They always show out no matter what. All right. I mean, do you think Jay took a little bit from this game as, or not even just Jay, but just the, the team in general, to where it didn't feel like a midweek game, right? No, no, no. This felt like this felt like a super no, regional no. game. Like this felt like that no. the way it was he, played. He alluded, he alluded to it very, very nicely, but he knew this was a big game, a big step and stuff for the squad. Yeah, and it's just he, and to do it in the fashion that they did yep. it is impressive. Putting your team on in, in the fire and saying, "Hey, show me what you can do." And then winning yeah. the way they won it, like that's an emotional game. I, I respect that. Did Paul yeah. ever do anything? Did you yeah. ever have any candid moments? Obviously, the the team coverage isn't the same as it yeah. is with like LSU Gold. But did you all have moments where you're like, oh shit, I didn't think he was gonna pop off like this right oh, now. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Of There's a lot of times like, yeah, he's now he never really like good jam- and bad. Of jumped in you the and, was yeah, but he he showed emotion. Yeah, I mean, we got a group up. I got the guy, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, coverage is so much different now, man. It would have been crazy if we got covered the way they get covered now. I don't know if that team would have handled it well. A lot of uh, personalities. We'd, no, we would have been good. We would have been good. We would have been good. Yeah. It just felt like the Omaha Zoo went real well. <laughs> <laughs> I, told her the, I told him the story about Buzz. Uh, oh, boy. When he, got, uh, when he did the boop, boop at the zoo. Yeah. Yeah. Boy. Oh, boy. Yep. Anyway. Go ahead. What's your curtain call? So that's his curtain call. My curtain call is hopefully not an actual legitimate curtain call for the Red Panda. LSU basketball wraps up its season for our own senior night. Curtain call for the basketball team? Curtain call for the basketball team. But more importantly, Red Panda. We talked about this a little bit pre-show, Jared. Um, Father yeah. Time's undefeated. Father Time is undefeated. She's had a couple of snafus where you know she used to, <laughs> she used to be like 100 for 100. Like it was a no-doubter. Would you- would you would you call this a snafu? A snafu. I've heard this. I've heard that one before. I've heard that one before. I can't. I can't be on your side, but I've heard that one. A little, a little mishap. That's another yeah. mistake. Exactly. So she, she's dropped a couple of plates recently within the last what I would say two years. It hasn't been the same red panda. The same red panda we've seen. So I'm hoping that I don't think it'll be her last one. But if it is, if there's another, you know, we're at the end of the tunnel. It may be the, the last Red one panda. at LSU. It might be the last one at LSU. But a curtain call to the Red Panda for still going out there every night she gets the call, doing the thing where she's on the extended tricycle, or extended unicycle, excuse me. Yeah, don't. And come there, on. yeah, try, by uni. And then she's able to, love is love. And then she's able to put, you know, obviously stack the plates on top of her head from her foot. And so, a lot of room for error there. She's been nearly flawless. But as we see Red Panda come down the end of her reign as maybe the best halftime performance ever, I mean, that and how, the quick change. How do you, how, how much do you think she gets paid for these halftime shows? I mean, it's got to be a lot for her to get out there. About as much as the superstars? How much do they get paid? They make bank. Yeah, I they don't know. The who? I, I don't know. I oh, think they're doing very the well. Uh uh. YouTube it after this. Okay. That's the next yeah. one up. I've seen the quick change. The super... the no, no, no. The gone. superstars. Yeah. All right. That's but that's because um, it could be the end of the road for old girl. Yeah. So Shout out Red Panda. If you, go, if you don't want to go see the LSU basketball team, but you do want to see maybe somebody's final performance that you could catch live, Red Panda. There you go. 
All right, I got two. Um, my, my first one is – yeah, I got two. My first one is to um, – I thought yours was Cajun Amis. Anyone who – I forgot. I anyone who is in the um, profession of moving, shout out to you. This shit ain't for the fan heart. It ain't that fun. I'm going to be honest with you. And my, and my second one is to everybody who is about to – actually get paid starting tomorrow with the NFL Combine because there are some dudes that's going to be some serious risers once tomorrow starts. And so some, shout and out some to y'all. Fallers, it's, and some it's a good day. It's a good day. But, I, but, but we're doing curtain calls. We're doing curtain, we're doing calls, curtain calls, right. calls. So I'm shouting, right. out to, I'm shouting out to the ones that's going to make the money. You're right. There you go. All right. Who's your pick? Who do you think is the if you could add name one name that's going to show up? Honestly, the Combine. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if we can call this make the money from where – we thought he would be at the beginning of the year, but I do know that Kayshawn's a track guy, and this is the usually the type of situations that would be very good for guys like him. I think he makes money in this one. I think if he looks good, if his body looks good and he runs really well, I think he can make some money. I think I think he makes money in this one. And I think that answers a lot of questions about him if he shows up and shows out, right? Shows up in shape, yeah. 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 No, no, I, I, I don't know if it actually answers him, but it makes it makes him look damn a lot better and people are like ah I know what I just saw on the field so no doubt there you go because um, it's not like somebody I mean we've interviewed him before on Kalata show and the, I wouldn't say he's he's a very quiet person whenever it comes to interviews so I'd imagine right. the team stuff is going to be it's going to probably raise more questions than answers but if he's able to do what like a Jamar Chase did where you just show up run 4-3 catch everything jump and it's like okay, we can't ignore it. Right, right. I know, I know what the I know what the physical side will say, and he hasn't been any and in any legal trouble, like real legal trouble. If you show up and show out, that that does overweigh a lot of stuff. Like somebody will take the chance, especially sure. if they feel like they got good leadership. So there you go. No doubt. And one more, one more curtain call because you're right. Kajanomics deserve his flowers from. If you were able to catch the stream on there, we're not trying to get him in trouble. I don't think that you know. I mean, it sounds like we are. We keep we keep calling him out. I like know, this, but the, the man we seems... need him again in the clutch soon. I know, yeah. but this man... and he performed yeah, he when we needed him most. Yeah, well, shit, y'all are flagging the hell out of him right I'm now. I'm not gonna say what he, he knows who it is. Hey. I'm just saying. Hey, you know who you are. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I don't you know go. who you are, but I do appreciate you. Y'all just snitching all day on this no. man. No, 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 no. I ain't get no meal. Just a little beat around the bush. <laughs> oh, my God. Just a little beat around the bush. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our Wednesday show. That starts. We started March off with a with a nice Ask Mikey and Mitch. No guests today. It's okay. We don't need the guests some days. Now we're we're moving and grooving, dude. We're we're cruising to what we to what we need to do, right? And so we appreciate your support. We appreciate y'all tuning in, watching, listening. Um, if you do like what you see or hear, please like and subscribe to our show. Please tell a friend, share it with a friend, introduce us to a friend. We love having making new friends. You know, we love that. And so uh, St. Patrick's Day right around the corner. St. Patrick's I don't know what that means about friends, but should they maybe throw out some QR codes. Uh, maybe. You throw out Mike make out the stuff that without even telling anything. You just literally just idea popped. Let me just make sure let me promo something that we don't even have any plan for yeah. yet. Could now, maybe. Look, look that's what he does. Maybe we have a plan we for it. We gotta start now. putting the pressure on Lloyd like that. Yeah. See how much he loves that. No doubt. Um, but if you don't like watching us and you like listening to us, we're anywhere you get your pods. Uh, again, we appreciate your support. We appreciate the love. We'll be back again from the studio this Friday from 1 to 3, previewing the weekend series before LSU plays. We had a whole bunch of other stuff that we want to talk about tonight, but listen, it's baseball season. LSU had a big game last night. You're going to get that majority right. of the time when you watch us. So uh, you're watching Mic'd Up. We'll be back again Friday from 1 to 3 p.m. from the studio. We appreciate y'all. Peace. Peace. Bye, Jared. Thank you for joining us. See you. Yo! Cool.